Good morning. Welcome into Herd at Sports Radio, AM 590, ESPN Omaha, ESPN Tri Cities. We're live on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube. That's DB. I'm Ravi Lula here on the Pillar Exterior Stage. What's up, DB? What up? How was your weekend? Uh, it was long for as many positives. Yeah. Uh, it was a little long weekend. I, I you know, I, you learn a lot about people. You do learn a lot right. about people. Like, uh, so that was first and foremost. Um, but I mean, shoot, you, you, you take the good, you take the bad. <laughs> I, I, I'm what is taking it, the them facts, both. The facts of life. Yeah. Is yeah, that? yeah. That's, 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 and that's really what this is. I mean, <laughs> like at the end of the day, this is, this is part of the, the facts of life. Some things, you know, there's a couple of hand, there's a handful of two, three things. i to go back to that we've talked about for a long time. Mm-hmm. Like almost since, uh, I don't know, just forever. So number one is the, there's one. There's a couple of concerns that I had. Okay, you stop me when I tell a lie. Okay, and they weren't as much concerns as much as they were thoughts. I said, you know, it's going to be interesting to watch some some guys older guys in particular that have habits that mm. will now have a lot of do you remember this conversation yep yep they have a lot of pressure put on them to be the man that haven't really been the man that haven't we're having this conversation this summer yeah yeah right some, somebody said oh if it go if it doesn't happen like what what are some of the issues the other one which i talk about all the time mm-hmm and and sometimes I think people construe whether I like somebody with whether I think they're good at what they do. And fortunately, especially after this weekend and, and seeing some people's immaturity, I can like or not like somebody mm-hmm. and and still I think be objective in terms of what they do. Yeah. So one of the things that I wondered about this this offense was What's going to be the – how much can you stay the course Mm. before you start to look at what it's producing? Mm -hmm. I always talk about, you know, you need that part of the process to generate the outcomes you want. Mm -hmm. So now you clearly have to weigh process versus the outcomes with this offense. I think with the whole team, honestly, but offense especially. Then you you flip over to – why would Coach Rule say something like, I didn't see this coming? Hmm. So th- for whatever the reason, even some former players, which I was shocked, although a couple guys, I mean, I just, it's just who they are. I take it with a grain of salt. But what a coach is, what a, I didn't see the big deal with that because what I thought he was, all I, all I heard him say was, I thought we'd play well. Yeah. Right, like what I heard was, I thought our prep was good, and so, I thought we'd play well. So I didn't, I didn't get like why that was so traumatic, especially having coached, right? Because yeah. it's like, and I remember there's only a handful of guys that I think are around enough that know enough mm-hmm. that I actually would like talk to about the inner workings. Sure, one of them is Foreman. Mm-hmm. So he was in Bloomington, and and we were talking, and I said. You know, he's like, I heard, you know, we were talking about how I wish, how when I said I wish I could peg emotional psyche. Because mm. if I could peg emotional psyche, then I felt like. You knew how the game would go. I would know how the game would go. Yeah. Because when a couple guys had said 10 plus, and I was like, well, it'll be close. But if there's a blowout. You thought it'd be Indiana. It, I did, yeah. I said, you, said, I, you said that on Friday. I said I, it would be Indiana mm-hmm. that did the blowing out. Only because I think the, there's this great big thing we're missing. You don't have to agree with me. I got plenty of phone lines open, 888-638-4876. Because I heard this a lot, right? The Signetti year one versus Coach Rule year two, right? How can a first-year guy at Indiana do this? And, I, and, I, and I, I, I look at this team. I look at what they've been through. I looked at kind of the waste that was laid mm-hmm. Saturday Yesterday morning, um, you know, and, and I think to myself, never, ever, 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 
ever underestimate feeling like a winner. Mm. Because I think at the end of the day, when you have these projects, it's all about belief. I think it's it's one of the reasons we've seen we've seen two different kind of styles in our last two staffs of how they they built the staff. Mm -hmm. Coach Frost brought everybody. Mm -hmm. We didn't like that. Nope. Well, we did it first, and then we didn't. Okay. We we didn't like that. Coach Rule. Had the chance to to make a couple of hires. Now we're parsing through that. Mm -hmm. Coach Signetti, on the other hand, brings his entire staff. Entire staff from James Madison. And a bunch of players. And a bunch of players. Mm -hmm. They'd won a lot. He had resolve in that. Because they've generated a winning product, Mm -hmm. see, nobody questions it. Now we like it again. Well, and and they may have all always liked it. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it was enough on the radar. I don't know if anybody cared enough at the at time. At Indiana, yeah, right, which is different. Right. But I'm not. But I'm not. What I don't want to do. I actually think that's a good thing that they didn't care enough in Bloomington because there's something about rebuilding under or, the radar. Under the radar. Yeah. Then, un, under the microscope where we critique everything, but I don't want to trade fan bases. So here in my heart there. I don't want to I don't want to so I want the interest, I want the scrutiny, I want like I want what comes with that. But I do think it's extremely advantageous when I look at where you want to do it. Yeah, when you're getting going. Because it's it, easier when it because yeah. on a on a smaller scale, I'll give you an example of the one that I've been using lately, and everybody asks me, Oh, what's wrong with Dylan? What's wrong with Dylan? And it's only a handful of people that, because nobody really wants to say it out loud. Mm-hmm. We're still, we're still kind of afraid to criticize quarterback play. We, we part of the reason that we're so hard on Satterfield, in yeah, my because, opinion, because we're fr- we're afraid to say anything. Because if we, yeah, if we can't say anything bad about the quarterback. Yeah. It's got to be the offensive coordinator, right? right? Uh, um, and uh, but you have to, you have to, you have he, to say what it is. Yeah, he needs to play better, right? Um. So, like when I'm watching this whole thing unfold and i go back to last week i said i wonder what it will be like to just play free to Mm. just say to yourself i said this to jay in the in the press box like we're so afraid we like we squeeze like that that fourth down where he threw the interception Mm -hmm. i mean you had a number two just ran a little uh quick choice route he's wide open Mm -hmm. he's it's just throwing the ball. Yeah. Right? It's, it's maybe 28-14. You go back to the very first fourth down on the fumble. Mm-hmm. Man, just slide left. Like, yep. You don't have to worry about taking care of the ball if you just move, you just move left. Mm-hmm. Right? What would it have been like to, to actually feel like you have a chance? And unfortunately, that's where this program is emotionally. So you have a couple of choices you got to make. I'm in a salute. A lot of people bitch and moan. They like that they they send me things as if I don't know what's going on, <laughs> no, and it's okay. I know. Like I know. It, it's it's aggravating because sometimes I feel like you you want to say no 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 you don't say right like no bleep. Pro- yeah right like I probably know more about this than than most people than most yeah. Okay, but it's okay because I still want people to be able to um, learn and, mm-hmm. and and grow. But I started thinking about something this this weekend. Nebraska, as I said, this going into the bye, you know, Nebraska will have the opportunity to critique some things. Yeah, look at some things. You know, Coach Royce. One of the things that excited me about the bye was when he first said, "What do we do well? What are we spending so much too much time doing that we're not doing well?" But so, so I'm like, okay, kind of pared that down because that will eliminate either the tactical or technical. Mm-hmm. Either the philosophy or either the scheme is flawed or you need different players. Yeah, you need them to execute it better. Right. Or guys that will execute yeah. it better. Yeah. See, now the, the rabbit's got the gun. Mm-hmm. So now you have, you have, to, you have to really be, think critically about – what do I do with 
who I want to play, how they played, and how much do I owe the opportunity that we're still five and two with some goals still out there? Mm -hmm. See, that's the that that's the challenge. Yeah, like the challenge is okay. We get because you know what I don't really believe yet. What's that? And I'll and again eight 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 six three eight. I'm I'm here for however long with you. I'm not ready to have the talent discussion because what I feel, what I think is mm -hmm. when I look at Surratt, I'm not so sure that I don't know if he's, I don't know if he's better physically than, than banks. Mm -hmm. But what I do know is he plays a lot freer. Yeah. Then, then goes out and makes plays. Goes. I, when I look at who's the other little guy that I like, another guy that made a one handed catch. For I, I look at his body language. Mm -hmm. He plays a lot freer than Nair, even though I think Nair's a Sunday talent. Like yeah. Nair, Nair will, will test, and he's going to jump well. He's going to run well. You know, you, you, sometimes what you can't see, you can't see how hard or how free guys play. Mm -hmm. Guys play tight. Yeah. Deshaun Singleton is not playing very well. Mm -mm. Deshaun Singleton would be a guy that would test very well. Mm -hmm. What's... What's the holdup? Yeah, what's the disconnect? That's what they got to figure out. Mm -hmm. Because you have to, because now this team has to understand okay, we're five and two. We got Tuffy at Columbus. Um, you know, we, 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 the, the goal was to get to a bowl game, to improve our record from last year. You can still do all those things. Mm -hmm. But now, what are you going to do in the meantime to rectify what you know ails you? You know, we're, we're so hard. And I'm not trying to correct everybody's thoughts, but I would challenge folks that say this. When you look at the run game mm -hmm. and you say, oh, I'm, mad, I'm mad at Donnie Rio. Ah, man, offensive line needs to play better. Right. We got plenty of time to pass, bro. Plenty. Lots of time. Okay. So when it comes to run blocking, they're not so inept that you can't, not look at numbers mm -hmm. if you're going to stop me if you've heard me say this before if you're going to get in the shotgun and hand the ball off to your running back mm -hmm. one of two things has to be happen hopefully both you either have to have the threat of a quarterback being able to run the ball mm -hmm. or you have to be exceptional up front why because you, it's a numbers game. Yeah, you got to match up the numbers. It's a numbers game. Right, you're counting people in the box. Indiana can play, anybody can play with one free defender mm -hmm. if you don't have to account for the quarterback. Yeah. You, you, so it doesn't matter how good, it, I'm not going to say it doesn't matter because it kind of does, mm -hmm. but a lot of times it doesn't matter what you're doing from a run blocking standpoint. If you're not going to win the numbers game, mm -hmm. you know, he said, because like those guys are like, they know better. Mm -hmm. It's just how much do you want to do? Are you, is your philosophy, hey, make the free guy miss? Is it, hey, get him to the second level? It, so th those are things that I don't know. Right. Right. I just try to, I just try to watch. And, but I mean, a lot of people have opinions on, I, if I had to guess, I would guess it's make the free guy miss is their philosophy based on the things they've said. Because you have to know you're one short. 100%. Okay. Right? Like, I mean, they can count the same as we can. So I don't, I don't know what. But the way they talk about it. It's, I don't know about like what sweeping. Like judgment. Judgments you I would make yeah. ab ab about run blocking. Now, I do know you got to stop getting whipped on the perimeter. Like that I can see. Right. Like across the board, not oh, just one, the blocking, right? No, like one hundred percent. There's what you what you say to me Saturday when you called me after the game, Saturday evening. Where did I, I don't know. You said, "Wins Nebraska going to win a one on one." Yeah, and that was yeah almost universal. That wasn't a specific play. That wasn't a specific position. I was like, okay, running backs in space. When are they going to win that one on one with the free defender? Right. Mm -hmm. Perimeter blocking with the wide receivers. When are they going to win that one-on-one -on -one with a the defensive a back? 50-50 ball. 50-50 ball in the air. When are they going to win that one-on-one? -on -one? We saw Indiana win the one-on-ones, right? We saw Surratt go up and get some some catches in in one-on-one -on -one situations. Some of those throws. Great hey. great spot on those, hey. right? By both quarterbacks for so, Indiana. So when you watch Rourke, mm -hmm. did, you, did you watch his movements? Like outside of? Did you see the arm talent? 
Like that wasn't a guy. That's not a guy. Yeah. That's overly gifted. Yeah. That's a guy that has tremendous mastery mm-hmm. of, what of, asked to do. of what he's being asked to do, and a ton of confidence in himself well, and in what he's being asked. He has. He is so efficient. Mm-hmm. Because of the, you can just tell. Yeah. He can barely walk. Mm-hmm. Did you see him scramble? It it took forever. You want to call it that? Yeah. He he made he made a guy miss without even yeah really doing anything. He just but I you know he's pretty crafty in mm-hmm. the pocket without being very athletic without having to move a ton. The hell Mary with no wind. Mm-hmm. He didn't he didn't get it there. No, no. Right, but the, he's really really good. Mm-hmm. So where do I weigh? Physical being physically gifted mm-hmm. and just being like whoo. Just mastery of what you're doing. Versus being really good at what I'm asked to do. Yeah. Indiana's somewhere in the middle. Probably. Right? I look at their defensive guys, but then I look at our guys, and I'm like, mm, that's not, for whatever the reason, boy, that those, those are guys that are checking the rearview mirror. Mm-hmm. Those are guys that are checking the rearview mirror. And so I go back to, like, where they've come from. Mm-hmm. And it was my, it was my number one concern this summer. Guys that haven't had a lot of freedom to be free mm-hmm. and have success now have a lot of psychological or a, a lot of emotional pressure. So, it, so it's when you hear Jamari Butler say, when we make a mistake, we can't get our heads down a little bit. Yeah. You know, there's emotional. I, there's, there's two guys in particular I immediately think of. Yeah. I'm like, I know who he's talking about. Mm-hmm. But those are guys that have struggled emotionally here. Yeah. But are asked to be big time players. Big time players here. Yeah. I know exactly who he's talking about. Yeah. Right? And so there's something to I – got, I got four players at my house mm-hmm. when I get home. And – well, in and out all day. Let's mm-hmm. just say it that way. And there isn't – not a one of those guys that's been around long enough or hasn't won enough at what they do to have, to have felt like, oh, man, overwhelmed. It was more I can't wait. Mm-hmm. So that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. Yeah. So when you bring guys over that are used to win, I, I just think there's some, I see it at the high school level. There's something about being around winners. There's just something about thinking like a winner. There's, and you see it. And here's the million you, dollar question. You, you see it. Oh, 100%. You see a lot less talented or a lot less skilled or a lot less high in people be much more functional just because of the way that they pro- they think. Yeah, their mindset. It's like we've seen, we've seen this before. So here's the million dollar question for me. Like did did so El, on Ellison's long run, mm-hmm. right? Well, was it 21 seven, 27, The one where he spun Deshaun around. Yeah, to see him get through that super narrow hole. Mm-hmm. That's that's not really that's not his him running a four four or you know going to standing broad jump right ten seven. That that's a guy that's mastered his craft. That hole was so thin. Wallen's got to get his head on the other side. You have to squeeze on the down block. It was pretty snug in there, and he somehow kind of just did a little slight, slight shoulder turn. Mm-hmm. It's getting in the hole. Yeah. Gifts responsible for backside cutback. He plays a little bit of peekaboo. Bam, you're on to the second level. You got a DB that didn't close the distance, so you give a good running back a two-way go. Mm-hmm. That's, I mean... Any any decent running back should be able to handle that. Yeah, I mean, but I I did wonder like, he's not very confident to come make this play in the open field. Gifford, no, Singleton. Oh, Singleton. So Gifford was kind of on the backside. Yeah, yeah, he was on the cutback. Yeah, yeah, right. So I'm like, how much of this is would I change the scheme? Would I? Would you try a different guy back there? Would I try? Like, I don't know because I don't really know how they feel. I just know how it looks. What it looks like. Yeah. Let's get to uh, Jay here on the Herd at Hotline. Wants to have a little discussion about the game. Jay. Turn your radio off, bud. Hello, gentlemen. How are you? Thank you. What's up? What's up? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yo. Hello? Yeah, you're here. You're. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. All right. Well, uh, first off, thanks for having me this bright and early morning. <laughs> Appreciate um, you. 
I appreciate the opportunity to get this off my chest and my daughters don't have to hear it now. So I feel like the sky isn't falling. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm trying to remain optimistic in my fandom. Um, there are a couple things that I feel like are very glaring, though. One of them uh, being this. I have a friend that consistently rails on Satterfield, and I take up for Satterfield, right? Mm. Uh, but Saturday, that's over. You know what I mean? I kind of feel like we have a lot of talent. Uh, when I say a lot of talent, I'm, I'm speaking of the way we described our transfer running back, uh, uh, wide receivers, the way we res- described describe Fedoni, the way – um, we reluctantly describe the five running backs we have and the improvement of the offensive line. I don't think all of those things went out the window. I think the talent and the skill is there. I just think when I look at the plays, it seems as if we're not out scheming defenses the way we're being out schemed as a defense. Mm. And I think that there needs to be some complimentary football being played in the coach's office because those, you know, unfortunately we have, you know, a very emotional team, which we, I think I heard you explain a little bit, Damon. Our team is emotional, meaning that when their emotions are high and they feel good, they can play like Yeah, that. they look like they're moving faster. Yeah, they look like they are. They look like like the athletes they truly are. Um, and we saw a glimpse of that against Colorado. And we, you know, to be honest, we haven't seen it since. I don't think they've been emotionally keyed up like they were in that game. And then Saturday uh, was, was probably the most disrespectful loss to my emotions. This is just the reason why. Because I did not expect us to even go in there and be talented at that level. Mm. I thought our defensive line was going to dominate and we were going to play, you know, good football. And to see the outcome be so drastically different than I expected, I think that's what shook me a little bit. Uh, but I will say this. The, the, the offense has been sputtering for weeks. We see it. There needs to be a change. Um, and any good leader, this is what I will say about Matt Rule. I told my friend, I said, Satterfield got fired last year, and he didn't understand what I meant. And I said, well, he brought in Buddy. Anytime you are in charge of something and somebody assigns you an assistant, the writing is on the wall, sir. You're on your way out of the door because someone now is supposed to hold you accountable to your responsibilities and help you. Mm. Um, and, and, and I feel like Matt is, uh, Coach Rule is probably going to make a, a drastic change very quickly because yeah. he understands and sees that it has really nothing to do with the boys. It it like it feels coming. it feels like that's coming. Yeah, it's got it's got to come just because it just makes leadership sense. Yeah, you can't preach consistency and accountability to the guys and not let that carry up all the way up the totem pole. And I feel like I've heard that that's the kind of guy he is. Mm. I've heard that he gets on coaches in practice, and if he gets on coaches in practice, then you better believe that there's some accountability as to why we can't move the ball against a team that was not more athletic and talented than us. They just out schemed us. They literally kicked our butt on a whiteboard, fifty nine to seven. Yeah. Mm, appreciate the call, Jay. We'll be back with more Herd Out Sports Radio coming up next. We're back here on Herd Out Sports Radio, AM five ninety, ESPN Omaha, ESPN Tri Cities. That's DB. I'm Robbie Lula here at Herd Out Sports Bar and Grill. DB, I'm having uh, I'm having a hard time trying to parse through some things here, right? Because I watch. And I, I watched the game, you know, a couple times over. I, I listen to the press conferences. I And then I, I experience a lot of the fan reaction, right? That's a lot of, like, I, I spend a lot of time doing that. And I understand the frustrations. I 100% do, right? Like, I'm not going to try and tell you, like, that loss was not as bad as it looked, right? It was every bit as bad as it looked. What I am trying to figure out about that game specifically without making an indictment on the entire season or the entire coaching staff or the entire whatever, right, is I know a lot of people are upset about the offense. Okay, I get it. 300 yards total offense. You don't love that. Didn't stick with the running game the way you wanted to. I get that, right? But I'm having trouble parsing through a couple different things. Number one, Hmm. if the offense had played better – if the offense had played up to the standard that we feel okay about, let's say they get 400 yards of total offense and score 30-some points. That's a decent day, right? They still would have lost by three touchdowns. Yeah, I don't know about that. Okay. I'm, I'm going to hear out the rest of the point, okay. though. Because the, the butterfly effect thing is... Sure, is real. Yeah. Uh, that, that's fair, okay. right? Yeah. But let's say, okay, whether it's three touchdowns or not, as the game played out, mm-hmm. Nebraska gave up 56 points. Right. Okay. Now, there's some garbage time late. 
where, you know, you've got some new guys in on the last couple series, whatever. They get, legitimately gave up 40-plus mm -hmm. to, to Indiana, right? Yeah. So I'm sitting there, and I go, okay, the offense could have played a lot better, and the defense still didn't play good enough to win that game, right? So that's what I'm having a hard time parsing through some of the butterfly effect you're talking about. It's like, okay, if they score a little more, the defense stay more confident. I, like, I don't know how that plays out. Nobody really does, right? Mm -hmm. It probably doesn't, to your point, probably doesn't play out the exact same way. But you could score a lot more points and still have not caught Indiana on Saturday. Yeah. Right? The other thing I'm having a hard time figuring out is obviously there's a lot of – So what's the consternation there? Like, I'm trying to figure out my – Why are we just mad at the offense? Yes. Okay. That That's kind of the disconnect I'm having a little bit there is and, – and I get a lot of it is because they – that people like Tony White, they don't like Satterfield. Right? So that's a lot of the – Mm -hmm. Focus on the offense versus 100%. the defense. That's I think that's a lot of it. I'm more disappointed in the defense because they had been better, right? And I know they can be better. So what you know what's interesting about that? And you, you can't really say all this during a broadcast, but one of the things I'm super cognizant of, because I've seen this play out, and this isn't at the – sometimes it's been at the collegiate level. and some, So I'm just talking about experiences. Mm -hmm. And there's been lots of games I've been a part of, some on the good end, some on the bad end, where I wonder what would happen if things happen just the opposite early, mm -hmm. right? I told you, I'm going to use this example because this is why I think psyche matters. Mm -hmm. We're playing Elkhorn South a couple weeks ago. Elk, I guarantee you, Coach Rosenberg would say, I didn't see that coming. Mm -hmm. Felt like they're prepared. He's got a really good staff. It got out of control early. Mm -hmm. You know why it got out of control early? Because their emotions went south. Mm -hmm. We didn't expect that either. It it absolutely happens. If if we're playing North early in the season, first game of the season, there's a scramble. Ball goes deep. If they catch that ball mm -hmm. versus not catching that ball, they probably feel different about the rest of that game. They're up 6 nothing. Sure. Okay. Um, a couple years ago at, at North Platte, mm, yeah. they get the ball. They drive down first. We had some concerns on the back end. Mm -hmm. It got exposed early, changed our psyche the whole rest of the game. So if somebody so, so, exposes so, a thing that you're already worried about? Or it's not really that so mm -hmm. much as – you have to stay present hmm. because if I'm Nebraska's defense and it went south early because you could see the body language where I'm going with this is two 50, 50 balls. One was on third down. It was third nine. He gets the big back shoulder throw. Nebraska had a chance to get off the field. Mm -hmm. I immediately looked at body language mm -hmm. and, and in my head, it's shoot. All right. He made a play. Mm -hmm. They're, they're going to make some of those trust it. Don't, don't go crazy. Like that's pretty good coverage. You yeah. can't you can't do any better. If he's than gonna that. make those throws and catches all day, then just like all right. er, just like early schematically. I'm like, hey, he hit you with that cutback. The scheme was good. Mm -hmm. Don't panic. Like though, so that that's kind of how I think because I've seen it. I, man, we got whipped mm -hmm. by Bellevue West about five six years ago. Thought we had a pretty good defense. Mm -hmm. I mean, whipped. They, I think they beat us by 40 or 50 maybe. And I liked our scheme early. But but their quarterback exposed where we were weak. We weren't good against QB run. We mm -hmm. were playing some two-man, and we were just doing like this nickel deal. And Glance kept buying time. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it was like an 18-play drive. And they ended up scoring. And we got away from it because – we and then we didn't feel so good. Mm -hmm. I'm like in my head, in retrospect. I'm like, no, that Just was stick good. With stick with it. S stay with it. Mm -hmm. That's what I think happens. That's how things get out of hand. Then you get guys double fitting. You get lack of discipline. You get hero ball. You get not doing your one of eleven because you you don't trust the process. That's the great dilemma for this football team right now. <laughs> Weigh the process. This is what we do. This is how we train. This is how we prepare versus, man, this didn't generate the outcome. We're still 5-2. and two. We know we've had some holes. We've been trending in this direction on 
on this side of the ball for this long and this side of the ball for this long. We act like this. Do you know why the defense gets a little bit of grace? Because they had been really, really good. Hmm? The offense doesn't get as much grace because they're kind of trending in this direction. Sure. They've been right? struggling. And special teams, I don't even remember. it. Like, was special teams horrible outside of the outside bad decision-making? kickoff? I don't think so. Okay. So that hasn't been good either. So we there's a lot less grace there. Mm-hmm. My point in saying this is the tough thing for Coach Rule and this staff is how much do I have to step on the gas to change the desired outcome versus – we're process oriented, so we better stay here. Mm. Like that, that's the thing. Because what ails, I'm telling you guys, nah, I, you don't even have to believe me because I don't really care. I know what I believe. This is, do they need a few more dudes in some areas? Sure. But you know what would really help? Mm-hmm. Belief. Yeah, if the dudes they had were in be- the right be- place be- mentally. Belief. If you, could, if you could rally from a tough situation and buck up, they they would look different physically. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because we've seen this defense look way faster than they did against flying. The yeah, it's hard when you're playing on your heels and you're and you're shook. You look slow. You think because I don't think Indiana is dramatically like, especially at skill positions. Indiana's not better than Colorado. Man, it just like they're just not. I mean, it. This was a team that clearly got in their feels early. So that's the thing that I'm having a hard time. One of the things I'm having a hard time separating, right? Because we just had a conversation of scheme versus execution on defense. Mm-hmm. It's always the great tug of war. And we're willing to have that conversation because we trust Tony White and we trust the defense, yeah. right? We're unwilling to have that conversation because on, on the other side of the ball with offense because we don't trust Marcus Satterfield. We don't trust the track record we've seen there. So my question is, like, is it that much different on offense that the execution is the scheme, the scheme versus the execution? Do you see the offense the same way? And we can pick this up on the other side here. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure because I wonder what, like, what would I see from the offense if Nebraska doesn't go down 7 nothing, and they inexplicably field a ball, like, on the two-yard line? Like, what are you doing? Yeah. See, that's, that's, a, that's a team that didn't stay in that moment. Mm-hmm. They, they're, they're too worried about what the defense just did. Yeah. Or didn't do, mm-hmm. right? Like, it's just weird. Drew, hang on the line here. We'll get you on the other side. That's DBM Robbie. We'll be back more Herd at Sports Radio. Coming up next. Welcome back to Herd at Sports Radio, AM 590, ESPN Omaha, ESPN Tri Cities. That's DB. I'm Robbie Lula here at Herd at Sports Bar and Grill. You can also find us on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube. Uh, before we dive back in, let's get to Drew here on the Herd at Hotline. Drew, what's going on, man? Oh hey guys, I, I, yeah, I just kind of you were just touching on it the last segment. But defensively, it was just bizarre to me because even early on when it was still a game, fourteen uh, seven, our defense, the body language is just awful. And I'm talking about guys that are experienced who are supposed to be the leaders of this program. Hmm. The heads were dropped. They they looked lost out there, like they had no confidence whatsoever. And this was still early in the second quarter. Um, and, and, you know, my concern with the Tony White is now I, it seems like we really struggle against RPO offenses that have a good decision-making quarterback who can get the ball out. Um, I think there's a trend now with that, and I'm, I don't know what your guys' thoughts are on that. But also, uh, just real quick, too, uh, wide receiver position, I, I'm not sure, like, what's going on with the perimeter blocking, but it's a problem. Mm. And I maybe I'm mixing coaching staffs up, but I, I feel like last year there's a rule, like, if you don't block, you're not getting the rock or you're not going to play. But that just seems to be thrown out the window this year because it's the same guys over and over again just getting beat on the perimeter against smaller defensive backs. And to me, that's just not acceptable. Mm. So, all right, I'm just frustrated. I'll hang up and listen to your guys' comments. Thanks. Yep. Drew, appreciate the call there. Well, he, he told no lies. Yeah, so I think there's <laughs> – he, he told no lies. 100%. I, I want to start with the defense because I think there's – when you're watching as a fan versus when you're in a game, right – there's a, I think sometimes we tend, because he said, oh, man, it looked like even when the game was still close that their heads went down. Can I just say something? Yeah. I got to get this out because we we just had this conversation yesterday as a staff. RPO is tough. Yeah. It is ridiculously hard. You have to concede something. Yeah, you have to decide what, what you're going to give up. You, you you just do. So, like, it's... So, like, triple option. I if it was me, like, mm-hmm. it's hindsight. I, I give up the quarterback run game. Yeah. 
I, I would especially I, to a guy like Rourke. Yep, I would give up quarterback run game. Yeah, and it's probably different versus each opponent. I, I, I would I would stop dive. I would combo mm -hmm. the RPO. I, I would let him run if he wants to run the ball thirty five times a game. Run the ball thirty five times. A we game. saw Michigan do that against Illinois, and and Altmaier beat him. So with like, a lot of with a lot of QB run, that, he did. That's, it's it's a but you do have to give up something. Yeah, right. Yeah, we, we just had this game. Like that's the dirty little secret about defense. Yeah. You can't Get, cover everything. Getting ready to play Papio, mm -hmm. right? Great RPO team. Yeah. It's like, all right, decide what you're okay with. with hey, up. we have to line, like, yeah, we have to like, it's hard. You have to decide the thing that you're like, okay, if they execute this at a high level, it's, we're okay with that beating it's us. It's really hard. Um, the, the thing I will say, though, is, is about the body language before we get to Lance here is there's a lot of times to go back to what you're talking about where guys, I think, will get down on something they see happening or they feel happening before we as a fan mm -hmm. feel like it's gotten out of hand. I agree. Right? Like, it could be 14 to 7. I agree. But if you're like, oh, man, we've gotten whipped on third downs a couple times. They're killing us on those back shoulder throws. Like, mentally, that can break you before the score goes. Right? So I just want to make, because I, I think sometimes we have a misconception about that as a fan base. Like, we're like, oh, it's still 14 to 7. Why aren't you fighting? What? And that's a fair question, right? You want guys that are fighting when they're still in the game. I'm looking at it at 21 7, even 28 7. I'm like, hey, there's a lot of time left. Like, let's go back and fight and see what we can do here. But if you're, if you're kind of what we're talking about, either your psyche is not right or there's a little like mental fragility there, like that'll get away from you before the score does. I, I think, and here's the other thing. Oh, let's get to Lance first. Uh, Lance, you're here with us on Herd Out Sports Radio. What's going on, Lance? Hey, guys. You know, <clears throat> one of the things that I, I think about. Saturday is that I, I kind of throw the score out the window because um, you were pressing, trying to get back into the game. And so I don't think, you know, I think that unraveled rather quickly. But when I think of, of the issues and even with body language, um, we, if you don't have belief in other areas of your team, whether it be special teams or offense, it's hard to keep rolling out there knowing that you, you're, it, it's, it's a done deal. I mean, our offense hasn't shown any ability to put points up at the rate that it was going to require to beat Indiana. Um, so I think that probably is like a double whammy on that psyche. One of the things that I really want to see them improve on, though, is, is that red zone offense. Um, I think they're 125th in the country now. Uh, I, I think there's some things they could do, whether it be, um, you know, the NFL runs a lot of shovel passes in the red zone. I don't think we've really seen that. Um, if you're not going to bring Harburg in, in the red zone to try to run it at him and, and play with numbers, then why we don't see more like orbit motion? Um, because I think people are kind of figuring out handing the ball off to Barney, things like that. Um, but I think if they get just better in a few areas, it'll be serviceable. They'll get to six and then get to the off season. What they fit, what they finish in the red zone, one of four. Thanks, thanks, Lance. What were they, one of four? Yeah, it was one of four. Because I think Indiana was seven of seven. Yes, I believe that's correct. That's incredible. Yeah. I want to get back to – I don't know about the – I don't know. I mean, I'm not going to critique every opinion. Uh, I, do, I don't know about – if you don't feel good about another un, – I don't think the defense looks at the offense and they're like, oh, we can't score or what. I, like, I can't – I think that's a real thing in some circumstances. I don't think – you look at Nebraska's offense as being in that situation. Like if you're the Browns and they keep trotting Deshaun Watson back out there, yeah, maybe I feel some kind of way. Yeah. Or even Nebraska last year where they're like, and I don't think it got that way, that way last year, but it very easily could have gotten to a point last year where it's like, man, they're not going to help us out at all, right? I think there's more extreme situations that where that can happen. I don't look at Nebraska's offense that way. Yeah, it's just the mind is really, really interesting. Yeah, it's complicated. It's you know, there, there, there's teams that we'll see. I hate to, to, to bring up high school, but it matters just because I know the young kids so well. Mm -hmm. There'll be there's young groups at other schools that I know there is no all factor. There is no oh we played against them as kids. They're they're just used to it. Mm -hmm. So they'll be better against us in the future than current teams are, even at the same school because they don't care, mm -hmm. right? They they they've they've had su success like. It, you know, the that's a weird example, but like the the Eichmeyers and the Velocics and the Hoskinsons will feel 
much more confident mm-hmm. about playing this version of high schoolers mm-hmm. as they get older because they've had success. Mm-hmm. That's a real thing. A hundred percent. That is a real thing. So here's so, here's the question. So though. when you're, I just throw out their name just because I mean it's just one of the really really good young groups that mm-hmm. I'm familiar with. I, I used to think that about like like Caleb's core mm-hmm. or you know they had so much success in in big games as kids that mm-hmm. like it didn't matter. I saw it with uh, like why did I like Keegan Johnson? Well, he had been really really competitive mm-hmm. in high level situations. Why did I like Xavier Watts? Been really really competitive in high leverage situations. Mm -hmm. There's just something to that being in your repertoire. Yeah. So whether you're coming from James Madison or St. Francis, I mean, Surratt started St. Francis, but he'd had success. Mm -hmm. He'd had success at James Madison. There's nothing about what he brings to the table where he's thinking to himself, man, I'm not going to get this done. Do you know who can't say the same thing? Tommy Hill. Yeah. So w- when psyche goes against psyche, I'm not sure how you legislate the talent. Yeah. Well, and there's, I mean, there's a couple things there. One, how many times have we heard Coach Rule bring up killing the bear, right? He, I, 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 I thought this may come up. So he's, he's at his own crossroads. Mm-hmm. He knows exactly what he's dealing with emotionally. Yeah. We didn't like him talking about it. Because mm-hmm. it's hard to talk about. Mental toughness. Yeah. Because you think... Because we were very critical mm-hmm. when he was calling it out. Or why does he want to have to go through the fire? Why does he want his guys to struggle? Like, why can't... Because I think that's the only way he thinks... You real figure gro- out who handles it. R- real growth happens. Yeah. Like, those, that's the only way you... The only way to figure out who can handle it is to go through it. Yeah. Right, and you don't want to go through it at fifty six seven. Now, Lance did make a good point. I kind of throw a score out the window too, because I. Well, Coach Rule talked about that a little bit. You just, you just get out of how they could have kept it. But I did you hear that he wanted the quarterbacks to have to go through that or have the opportunity to compete? Because I thought somebody asked me on air. Maybe it was Jessica. I don't know. May, oh, no, it's probably Greg about quarterback change. I'm like, no, like. Like, don't put that on Harburg. Like, Dylan has to go through this too. Mm-hmm. Right? Like, there, there's some growth that has to happen. Yeah. W- what was frustrating to me, when you're, you're getting your teeth kicked in, and we still have running backs that were spinning going into contact. Mm-hmm. Why does that upset me? Because I'm traumatized. I, I'm 21 carries for 63 yards against Washington State. We're winning. It's 35-21 or whatever the score is. And I remember getting pulled, and I go to the phone, and Coach Solitz just kept say, he kept saying, "This is a physical run game." And thirty three, which by the way was James Darling, a mm-hmm. really good player. He's like, uh, "We're trying to send messages. That's not how we run the football." And I just was like, "Oh, okay, got it." This plays. That's why I hate the spin move. Yeah. So every time I saw a guy spin. Saturday, I cringe because mm-hmm. I'm like, I'm going to give it to you physically, even if we're losing. Is that a big deal in the grand scheme of things? Probably not. But from a psychological standpoint, if you're pissed, give them your best as much as you can physically mm-hmm. and let the score be what it will. That that's, Those are the little things mm-hmm. that kind of bug me emotionally, right? If you're going down, go down being physical. That's CB. I'm Robbie Lulu. We've got Sam McEwen from the Omaha World Herald coming up next on Herd Sports Radio. Kicking off hour number two here on Herd Sports Radio, AM 590, ESPN Omaha, ESPN Tri Cities. That's DB. I'm Ravi Lulu. We're joined now by Sam McEwen from the Omaha World Herald. Sam, how are you this morning? Good. How are you guys? Doing okay, Sam. Doing okay. Of of so, lots and lots and lots of hot takes after this weekend. If you're coach rule and this staff do you start with mental stuff at this juncture in the season or physical at this juncture in the season well <clears throat> my my sense is that they're going to have to assess you know where the confidence level of the team is 
Jamari Butler made a comment after the game just about how if a bad play happens, their heads get down on defense. So maybe examining what was going on there. I assume they did that yesterday. Maybe talk through it. Uh, they go to practice today. Um, and then, you know, there's execution things that were all over the field on Saturday. It, th- that didn't appear to be, you know, uh, a complete embarrassment in terms of, oh, hide your eyes, the way maybe you would have seen a couple of those Ohio State-Nebraska games over the years. But it was still 56-7, and you can't, you can't really hide from that. And, 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 you know, Nebraska's defense was not up to the challenge, obviously. Uh, they, they didn't get off blocks. They didn't make tackles. Things didn't go well. I think Nebraska's offense, on the other hand, re- really needs to figure out who they want to be. So I don't know if that's mental. I don't know if that's physical, but you have to, you kind of have to assess that and, and work through it. And, you know, we, we saw Nebraska run 40 plays in the second half and they, they didn't score any points. So that that's concerning against a defense that I don't think is actually one of the 10 best defenses in the country. And I think gave up, you know, 28, 24 to uh, Maryland and Northwestern. So I think Nebraska has to really figure out who they want to be on offense and then be that team, uh, irrespective of who they're playing or, or the situation barring, you know, late game stuff where you're trying to win a game and you can win a game. Uh, Nebraska was behind, I don't know, 35, seven within, you know, halfway through the, the third quarter, you have to accept you're not going to win that football game. Almost 90, not well, 999 times out of a thousand, you're not winning that game. So what do you want to work on over the last quarter and a half? And I just didn't feel like Nebraska made much progress over the last quarter and a half of that football game. So um, they're going to have to figure out what they want to be and who they want to be on offense uh, for the last five games. Sam, how fine a line is it, though? Because you heard ex- the explanation, kind of, whether we like it or not, was you want to kind of go through the opportunity to put your hands up and fight back. Yeah. Now, at what point? I, I, so it's it's kind of a fine – it's a philosophical thing, right? Do you – do you go down like at what point do you concede the outcome versus trying to get better where you think you may not be as good? And I say all that to say it seems like he was more focused on the emotional piece than the tactical piece to get his sure. team better. Right? That yep. that's kind of what I heard him say. He's like, yeah. "Well, what what ails us?" Like, we got to learn to fight is, is kind of how I took it. I don't know whether we think that's yeah. right or wrong, but th- I think he was consistent in the message that he was trying to send. Yeah, N- nobody's talking about, you know, laying down. Um, again, there's, there's various ways you can, you can choose to do that. So, you know, again, Nebraska has to figure out exactly who it wants to be, and it has to execute that way, and it has to break tackles and make tackles. And, so much, you know, I mean, you know this, you know this better than I do. Um, a lot of the game is about blocking and getting off blocks. A lot of the game is tackling and breaking tackles. It's about making plays. It's not about schemes. And of course, it's about heart. But as he said, he didn't feel like, you know, players just gave up. And I, I didn't see that either. I did see, you know, at some point you kind of run out of pass plays that you feel good about and, and Indiana sort of, just kind of waiting for Ryola to make a mistake and that's tough to watch. So, you know, I, I, I think there's lots of things that, that they can grow from and, and it's hard in a week when you're playing Ohio state because you yep. want to make it about you yep. and you know, you're not playing, you, you don't get to come off the loss to Illinois and talk tough and look at everybody and go, all right, what do we need here? And, be, and because you're playing Purdue, um, you're playing Ohio State, so like you can do a lot of things right this week, and you can even play a pretty good football game and still lose by 21 points because Ohio State decided that they wanted to play their best game of the season. And if Ohio State plays its best game of the season, then then Nebraska is probably not going to win the football game. So, you know, I think there's things that you can work on. That's why I think it's about Nebraska's identity. They have to decide now who are we going to be because you could get down 17 nothing real fast at Ohio State through no particular fault of your own. Jeremiah Smith might make three plays that virtually no one else can make. and You're down 17 nothing, and you feel like you played pretty good football. Is that the point where you're like, okay, 
now now we're gonna now we're gonna do you know the four wide thing and 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 let Dylan try to figure this out or are you gonna stick with your identity? What what do they want to do? Who do they want to be? Um, I think those are questions that they have to answer uh, for over the last five games of the year on on offense. Sam, when you say stick with your identity on offense, do you have a good sense of what they want that to be? I think I think what they want it to be is they want to run the football and and then fake the run and throw the football off of, off of run fakes. What I think Nebraska is not consistently doing is blocking the guys in front of them, breaking tackles, and then when they want to throw the ball on a short pass to the sideline, a screen, um, you know, a smoke screen, which is really like a standard, like it's, you know, or a wide receiver screen or whatever, uh, they need to block. They, they, the guys need to block. And, and you know, Rucker, Rutgers, Indiana's guys blocked. They're great blockers. And they commit to it. And there was a play in the second half when uh, Tyson Lawton, I think, had a swing pass. He wasn't touched for like 30 yards. And there was a guy, one of Rutgers' guys was blocking the Nebraska corner like 20 yards down the field. I mean, they were blocking. And Nebraska wasn't getting off blocks, too. So Nebraska's execution has to be better. Like it, it, the, the quality of the execution from the skill players and the backs and, and to some degree the line uh, needs to improve. And I, obviously there's room for Rayola to grow, too. But, but Rayola's got to... He, he needs more help. Like the, the, This is not going to go the way that everybody wants it to go if it's like, okay, Dylan, you're a smart kid and you have a big arm. You know, figure it out. It's not going to go the way they want it to go. So, you know, if 84 has to go out on the field, I know he'll block, and they know he'll block. If that's what you got to do, you got to start putting guys that are really like fifth and 16 receivers on the feet or not fifth and 16 the fifth or sixth receiver on your unit if he has to go out there because you know he'll block for a running back then that's what you got to do like you can't you can't continue to block the way that Nebraska's blocked on the perimeter if you want those plays to be a part of your offensive identity now if you don't care and you just want to go away from those plays well then you don't have to put guys on the field that you know will block really well but if they want to continue to run those kinds of plays then they're going to have to put they're going to have to get better blocking out of their receivers. Sam, let me ask you something, because I heard this a lot, and it's interesting. And, and I'm just – I didn't have the full stomach to go back and watch everything yet. But just for instance, because I'm, I'm, I'm listening, and you sound a lot – You a lot of people are like you, right? Well, we, we're going to be good at the quarterback spot, but he's got to play better, but – as opposed to he's got to play better and. It's – He's got to play better, and he needs some help. It's not he needs to play better, but he needs some help. because. And I only say that because I'm looking at, like, the fourth down, the one that he forced to Fedoni. Right? It's a two-by-two two mm-hmm. set. He's got back to the field. There, there's, a, there's a six-yard little outcut that he could throw there. Yeah. That's, that doesn't have anything to do with talent. Nothing. Mm-hmm. Not, not concept, not bad play call, nothing. Just – He's open. Throw him the ball. Yeah. How do you how do you reconcile wanting to coach your best player hard, but knowing uh, he's still he, he's our he is our best player. Right. So yeah, on that particular interception, Dylan, in my opinion, didn't throw it to the right side of the field. He he had a player on the on the other side of the field that was open, and he stared Fedoni down, and so he brought the um, Asbury, the guy that made the interception, he brought him to the play. And, and even if there were, that, that throw was really, and I've just open. used that as a microcosm no, of, I totally understand. And, and yes, like I, I mean, there's things that he isn't going to do perfectly in part because he's a true freshman. I try to remind people, I, I don't know that there are any other true freshmen who are regular stars in college football. Hmm. Uh, I, I don't know. There were, there have been a couple over the last however many years. You know, Jaden Daniels did it. Caleb Williams did it. Well, I, I, one of the huge differences between, and I mentioned it in my column today, those guys run. Dylan is not a runner. So, like, he's never been one, and he's not, he's not going to become Caleb Williams. And so Dylan's not going to run around 
47 yards around the field. He, he, he can't run him on zone reads. Um, that's just not who he is. And that's okay. But knowing who he is, knowing that he's a true freshman, relatively stationary quarterback, you have to be really good around that. Mm. Like you have to accept that he's going to have growing pains, A. And B, you have to also say, well, we know he isn't going to run 35 yards sideline to sideline in order to in order to completely change the geometry of this play. Like that's not gonna that's not going to occur. And so knowing all of those things, you have to you have to build all you have to build your offense around a relatively fixed position quarterback who's also young. They chose to do that by by basically saying we're not going to add a transfer and tell Dylan that like, just like he would have to do at Georgia or just like he would have to do it. I don't know, Alabama, you're going to have to sit and wait because that's what true freshman quarterbacks do at the collegiate level. Unless you're Jaden Daniels who started right away or you're Caleb Williams who was pressed into action. Maybe they didn't have the leverage to tell Dylan, listen, you're going to have to, you're going to have to wait. You're redshirting this year, and you'll play your two years, and then you'll go to the NFL. But I don't. But I don't think Maybe. that's the. I don't think that would have been the answer, though. You know what I mean? I think he's. I think they're doing. I think playing is. I mean, he's their best quarterback, clearly. Well, he's their best quarterback because they didn't. They didn't go out and get Curtis Rook. And they didn't sign Colin McCord. And and I'm not saying they should have. I'm saying that like once you make that choice, mm. and you say, okay, we're going to go with a true freshman, and on top of that. He's a Troy Aikman. He is a drop-back passer. And there's nothing wrong with those things. You have to accept that the players around him have to be good. They, they, they have to be really good because he's not – he isn't going to, like, get you 70 extra yards with his running the football. So, like, when they run the ball, every time that Dylan is in, is in the shotgun, you know, and he, 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 he's not there, – there's no, like, triple option there. If he fakes it, he's either going to give it or he's going to throw it. But there's not going to be a runoff of that, and so the reality is defenses don't have to, they don't they don't have to like think about that, yeah. and so from my perspective, they they just have. I mean, he doesn't. He is going to end up being, in my opinion, a much better quarterback than Adrian Martinez was in the, at the collegiate level. For example, as a true freshman, we you and I watched it. Adrian Martinez goes to Wisconsin and Ohio State, and they're like, we don't know what the hell we're supposed to do with this guy because he can run and he can throw, and you know we're not sure what to do. And so they go to Wisconsin and they score 24, and he throws for 400. And they go to Ohio State and you know they score I don't know what they score 31 on Ohio State. Like these are these are harder things to do when the quarterback isn't mobile. That's why you got to be better around him. And so that's what I mean. Yes, you're right. He has to play better and he needs help. Given the circumstances by which you know they, he's young, he, he can't expect to, you can't expect him to have a 400 level knowledge of everything that's going on out there. It wouldn't be fair. Mm-hmm. And simultaneously, you you have been gifted with the strongest arm probably in college football, but he's also not going to run a ton. And so you have to play around that. And I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I just think Nebraska has to understand who they are and who you know like. He's he's more talented than Nate Stanley at Iowa, but like it's Nate Stanley at Iowa. Like that's that's what you're getting. Like you're 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 getting a quarterback, a, a drop back quarterback. So play you know game plan and and, and execute accordingly. Um, do, I mean you know from your perspective, as you watch the receiver, you're up there and the, you know in the same vantage point we are. Do, do you feel like Nebraska's receivers and backs are playing at anywhere near the level that Indiana's backs and receivers were playing on Saturday? Oh, I so no. The the short answer is no. But I also feel like freedom of movement within said offense and mastery is part of it, right? When you can play free and you know what you're doing and you're free to do so, it's gonna look different. So I don't. I'm mm-hmm. not that linear, and not that you're wrong. I'm saying like I know Indiana is gonna do the same four things. They they are concept right. wise. Right. Mm -hmm. It's not like, I mean, do they get credit for drawing up back shoulder throws on third down? No, that's execution. So it's not like I'm saying to myself, oh, man, this is this is Norm Chow SC. That's just they have mastered what they do really well. They run RPO, Sam, without work being a runner. 
Like that's right. just that they're it's just efficient because they know where they're where the third of the triple option is. Like it, so I don't get into the well, their guys are better than our guys. I look at they're better at what they do than Nebraska is at what they do. That that's kind of how I looked at it. Right. So like two of the first three passes of the game, not the one to Fedona, but the other two were Dylan throws right. Yeah. It does not appear that he and the receiver are on the same page at all. So in one of those, Dylan expects him to sort of stay out, out, mm. and like catch yeah. the ball. And I don't know. You're talking about the one that he threw out of the one that he threw out of bounds. Yeah, where where Nayor cuts in. Yeah. On a slant. Yeah. Right now it throws outside, and then they complete the pass to Fedoni. And then the next time he throws out there, I think it was like a one-yard gain or a zero-yard gain. And, and, again, they did not appear to be on the same page. Now, I, you know, I don't know who you – I guess my, my – So, so, that's, my so that's, that's a perfect, is, is that's a perfect that that's example. Fault, like, that's a perfect think. example of what I'm talking about. So people want to talk about talent or skill guys. See, that's not a that's not a talent thing because what would happen at a combine is Nair would test and Surratt would test and Nair would be the guy that they're going to, oh, look at his long arms and he's fast and he can do this. But you don't see that show up on the field. So if you wanted to say to me, hey, you know what, they need to maximize their personnel or, you know, Nair needs to play better or they need to be on the same page, it still is going to boil down to being a master of their own this is a stupid term, but like kind of their 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 domain, like that right. pitch and catch combo isn't more talented. They're significantly more efficient. So Nebraska has to figure out what's the problem. Do we not know enough? Yeah. Is this a teaching thing? Do we need to simplify? That's where the whole process versus outcome is difficult because you're mid season and you're five and two. You're not two and five. Right. Right. No, I mean, yeah, that, they, it, yeah. They they haven't they haven't played horrible all season long. I think the thing that people look at is okay, they're going to play Ohio State, tough one. Doesn't really matter how well Nebraska plays, could be tough. Uh, and then you look at the games after UCLA, and you see three teams that are probably equally talented as Nebraska, and you just wonder, you know. And so, like, I think everybody's hope is that. You know, it, you get to a bowl, but then maybe there's a little bit of there's a little bit of extra gravy mm. on top of that. So, you know, I, I, again, like, I, and I'm not just looking at short term. I'm also looking at like, you know, it's not just a short term reality, but but where's this team going to be? You know, and and I wrote this in a column. Where's it going to be in 25 and 26? And and why will all these things coalesce together? I mean, they, you know, they went out and signed two senior receivers because I think they wanted to win now. It wasn't because now these two senior receivers will come in and they're going to make they're going to make the guys behind them a lot better in the following year, even though those guys aren't going to play. So I think they wanted to be good this year, and you know, uh, Jalen Lloyd is improving. I I, I think Jalen Lloyd's had. I, nice I, I like the little subtle sure. move to let him work in the slot. Yeah, I th- I think he's I think he's improving, and that's good. We we haven't really seen Malachi Coleman, so you know I don't you know I don't know that that's going to happen i don't know that saturday was one of those games um that he was going to play in but you know so it's it's a unique it's it's a unique moment uh that they're trying to work through and and uh you know what at the end of the day hey at the end of the day they are five and two and uh people you know this is a long this is a long sprint and a long marathon it's not a sprint it is disappointing that Nebraska lost by 49 to a team that yeah could not have could not have been within 14 points of Nebraska last year. Um, and it's a sincere credit to their coach and to the staff that, that they've got those guys playing so, so, so poised and so, uh, so composed. I, I, again, Nebraska's defense has, we didn't even talk much about them. They're concerning. And sure, you, you never want to see them play like that. I just feel like the defense can rebound from that and, and play better. I think the offense you know, needs to keep coming because uh, I, I think it's just going to get harder and harder uh, to move the football against teams like Ohio State and Iowa and Wisconsin if you're not if you're not really good at something. And I think right now Nebraska is just so so at a bunch of things on the offensive side of the ball. Just my opinion. Sam, when you're looking at that defensive side of the ball, do you think at all 
that maybe playing in some of the younger guys would help. When you hear Jamari Butler say things like, you know, some guy, sometimes a bad thing happens and guys get their head down. Like, how do you right. fix that? Is it just playing guys that don't have the baggage of, of past failures? Or, or in your mind, how does that get fixed? That's a really good question. I think, you know, on some level, Nebraska's got good defensive players who are also seasoned and experienced, and we have seen those guys execute at a really high level. And so to say that, you know, time to go to the young guys, I, especially in the secondary, I, I watched the game again, you know, I don't think 31's as good as three. For example, I don't think the younger brother's as good as the older brother, uh, based on what I was watching. Um, you know, I, I, I don't think they have like new answers at safety that they're just going to bring into the game. Uh, you know, so I, yeah, I mean, I, I think you can play some different guys back there, but I think the guys who are there, the guys who are there, I think at linebacker, they are playing more guys. Uh, obviously, Shavers is playing more. Um, Bullock didn't have his best game, but you're not going to take John Bullock off the field. That guy's going to do for the first six games of the season. And he's, he's in a, uh, I won't get into that. It's con- that. He was in a bind. You know, box five having to stop that RPO with the way that they yeah. played that front was going to be hard on insides. It, it, they, it, and they knew it, it was going it, into the game. Yeah, it, just, it just was going gonna, gonna to be tough. Yeah. Hey, Sam, good offense and good offensive line. So. Sam, let me ask you something real quick because you said something on social media that I thought was interesting. And two things could maybe be true at once about the, the level of play in Oregon and Ohio State versus Georgia and yes. Texas and Bama and Tennessee. Don't you think Texas and Georgia would – could beat Ohio State though, or no? Sure. Yeah. Just the I do. St- but, yeah, know, it was, I mean, it was the, like it was the twenty-seven and... penalties, or because <laughs> yeah. I think I think they finished that's at not, twenty-eight. I mean, that's not that's not good football. And and well, the, the athletes are so good they just can't help but have seven combined turnovers and twenty-five penalties. <laughs> <laughs> you go back and watch. I'll tell you what. You go back and watch the twenty nineteen LSU Alabama game with Tua and Joe Burrow, and that's about as good a football as you're ever going to see in your life. Mm-hmm. In college, I mean that's that's two teams that have all stars everywhere, and nobody can stop anybody, and that's great football anyway. And the SEC is not that anymore. We need to be honest. The SEC's talent pool is dispersed, yeah. and so you don't have Alabama, Alabama, LSU from 2019 on the field right now. And uh, Ohio State and Oregon have a lot of talent. Like they have more talent, I think, than than Georgia does maybe not texas but Ooh, more talent than georgia uh, and probably alabama Ooh, and so know. you know like i think the quality of football is just super high um with ohio state and oregon they're good teams and i again we just the sec isn't quite the league it was five years ago but the narrative around the sec is really 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 good the big 10 is better than it was five years ago because everybody remembers how ohio state just humiliated everybody that season in 2019, you know, the Big Ten is better, but I don't know that the narrative has changed much. And so, you know, you, but Big Ten football is good right now. This is, this is, these are good teams that we're seeing, and Nebraska is not going to have it easy down the stretch. They're, they're going to have to play good, hard football to win two games, much less four. So it, it, the challenges are in front of them, and they, they're going to get tested, and, and we'll see how they do. That's Sam McEwen from MMA World Herald. Sam, we appreciate it as always. We'll talk to you next Take week. Take care. Thanks, Sam. More Herd at Sports Radio coming up next. Halfway through the show here on Herd at Sports Radio, AM 590, ESPN Omaha, ESPN Tri-Cities. That's the I'm Ravi Lula. We are here at the Pillar Exterior Stage getting into all sorts of Nebraska things. We'll talk some national college football coming up at 9 as well. Uh, we got uh, Brandon Marcellus from CBS Sports, so we'll talk that here in a little bit. But, you know, there's – you asked me an interesting question off the air about my level of concern. Yeah, because I – you know, again, I don't know if it's because people – maybe they just don't – maybe deep down, like, people want me to, like, be upset or – whatever so this is the thing that i think we both experience a lot real quick is that because we tend to be i think a little bit more even keeled about certain things that when something bad happens people will try and like throw it in our face to see if it's like well are you mad yet 
And I, I feel like that happens a lot. It's, it happens to me quite a bit. Yeah. And so sometimes I have to say to people, hey, look, man, like, you're not enhancing my life at all. Yeah. Right? Like, typically you get something from me, whether it's info mm-hmm. or the the camaraderie or whatever. But, like, occasionally just be like, hey, man, you good? Like, this got to be tough. Yeah. Or, hey, I know you're invested across the board. But people, maybe I come across as machine-like, so... People think I don't have feelings, mm-hmm. but occasionally I like it comes out. Yeah. Right. And so our buddy asked me the other day, he said, Hey, just one simple question. And I, he's like on a scale of one to 10, how concerned are you? I said, man, I'm not getting into that tonight. Mm-hmm. Right. I'm not panicking. Right. I've been back for whatever. Right. And I'm still a little like I got a ton of things are going through my mind, mm-hmm. you know, Mental toughness, physical toughness, like emotional investment, like lots. I'm a modern, the whole nine. And and he said, hey, that's all I was looking for, just a quick snippet. He's, he said, enjoy the rest of your weekend. And then I thought about it for a second. And I said, well, I'm not as concerned about Nebraska mm-hmm. as I am Iowa or USC or FSU or Michigan or Bama. Is that perspective? Yeah. Pers- Iowa. Perspective. USC, yeah. FSU, Michigan, Bama. The only reason I said those teams is because they're supposed to be a certain place. Mm-hmm. And they're not at that place. They're not at this place. Mm-hmm. And it actually happened to them. And, and they're kind of trending in those areas. Mm-hmm. So it's not to, to deflect. It's perspective is important. Again, Coach Rules, they've been together a year and a half. Mm-hmm. A year and a half. And here's the dirty little secret that we better say this out loud. Like, winners win. Mm-hmm. They faced winners. Yeah. I don't care what jersey they were wearing. They were facing people. Guys that, that had, expect to win. That had a lot of success. Yeah. I, I gave you the example with the young group at Elkhorn South. Mm-hmm. Like, those guys are going to those guys, those youngins, mm-hmm. they're winners. Yeah. Right? So they're going to expect to win. There's something to that at at especially when you get off to a start. And and listen, this is where I think the schedule is was really advantageous for Indiana is it allowed them to get proof of concept early. Yeah. Right? Oh, one hundred percent. So there's no you go and, from, and even though Nebraska's five and one, when you're shaky and you haven't won a ton and people are still questioning mm-hmm. your five and one, see they don't feel good. Like they feel like there's still this proof thing, right? But that's that's where the but, building but, under the radar thing comes up that you but, talked but, about with Indiana, right? But that's not what people want to talk about, and I kept saying that about Indiana. See, in Bloomington, hmm? and I don't want to swap fan bases. No, clearly I don't. But there are some advantages because they were just looking for a reason to say, "Yep, we're back." Yeah, no matter how false it was or wasn't, mm-hmm. because it they hadn't experienced it, so you. So you and they don't expect to be and you kept yes. you, winners were continuing to be encouraged. There were no right yes hundred <laughs> percent. So it's like because you know what those guys you know what Surratt and Rourke, you know what those guys don't think. Mm-hmm. <sighs> well, this is Indiana. We don't know any better. Or that is what yeah. they're thinking. Yeah. Right? It's not like well, this is Indiana. We're not supposed to. We're all of a sudden supposed to not have the success that we've had the last two or three years mm-hmm. at our previous stops. That's a that's an that's an advantage that you're not getting here because even when it looks like it's moving in the right direction mm-hmm. or you are five and one, it's like, well, we're not this and we're not that. And we have no this. And I mean, we're the biggest C I told you mm-hmm. that I've like, that I've ever seen. And, and I'm not saying I rather have apathy, but it certainly isn't healthy No, because you, you better, you better, you better, 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 better have folks that make a lot of money that can insulate because they're not emotion. The, the player, they're, it's just not, it's not healthy enough for them to thrive yet. It's there's, not. There's three things that I don't know if we're going to get to them today because we've got a lot going on, but that we're going to get to at some point this week. You touched on one of them right there. That's perspective. Okay. Another one that we kind of touched on a little bit is expectations. The other one that I want to talk about at some point this week is dealing with failure. Yeah. Let's get to Jack before we uh, get any further here on Herd Out Sports Radio. Jack, what's going on, man? Hey, good morning, fellas. How you doing? What's up? 
Hey, well, I, I, you know, this isn't a, I, I got a couple of three questions for you and I'll try to hit you real quick, let you move on. But I'm a little confused as to why when we go heavy that they don't put Harburg in the game. Mm-hmm. You know, the guy was in there like two plays and I'm not saying replace Ryle with him and all that stuff. We, you know, I'm not saying we need a quarterback change, but there's places that that guy gives us something that Dylan doesn't. And I don't understand that why 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 he's sitting on the bench in those situations. The other thing I, that I, and I I'm just going to say about that game is I turned over and watched a lot of Miami and Louisville about halfway through the third quarter, and I don't like doing that. I don't want to be. I, I, we did that during the Riley years. We did that during the Frost years, huh. and it got to a point where you didn't even want to listen to their press conferences. And I don't want that to happen. There's got to be something needs to be adjusted in this offense, and I don't know what it is. I'm not saying anybody. I don't get paid seven million dollars a year to make those decisions, but something needs to happen because uh, Dylan is regressing, not progressing, from the first of the year, and there's got to be a reason why. Other, other than the fact that, you know, we don't have much of a run game, and apparently we didn't get any receivers open uh, because, uh, you know, we can't live on those little dink and dunk passes to the uh, to the safety valve guy, you know, that get 11 receptions for 52 yards. That's not – it's not going to work. And uh, I'll uh, shut up and listen to you, but, uh, you know, I just don't want to see this get to a frustration build – to the point where people quit caring. I'll I'll, uh, I'll listen. Thanks, guys. Jack, appreciate the call uh, as always. Always good to hear from our guy Jack. Um, I, I think there's a couple things in there, and, and I agree with Jack. You don't want it to to regress to the point where people are not looking forward to games and stuff like that. Like I get that, but I, I think a couple things can be true at the same time with kind of the offense specifically. Is you know Dylan might not be playing as well and he needs to play better, like we were saying with Sam, and the receivers are regressing also, Mm -hmm. right? Uh, Heinrich Harburg might be useful in some situations, and maybe we're not blocking well enough on the perimeter for him to be useful, right? We saw it on the run on the the touchdown drive where Fedoni whiffs on a block. That would have been a touchdown for Harburg, right? Now he comes back and makes the block on the next play where Barney scores, but... Like, if you're not blocking well on the perimeter, Harburg becomes dramatically less impactful. Mm. But you can also have that conversation and say, hey, you know what? If you sub him in mm-hmm. and he runs for nine, you may want to stay with that, too. That would be one of those things where people would be unhappy with sure. with, with that, right? Yeah. And and have – and it's valid, yeah. right? Because that doesn't – that didn't seem to have any rhyme or reason to it. Yeah, when he would come in. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yes. So, like, uh, th- that's another one of those things that c- where a couple things could be true at once. Uh, TK, hang on there. We'll get to you when we come back and talk a little bit more offense. That's DB. I'm Ravi Lula at Herd Out Sports Radio. Wrapping up hour number one here on Herd Out Sports Radio AM 590 ESPN Omaha, ESPN Tri-Cities. That's DB. I'm Ravi Lula. Don't forget to make sure you get out to Union Omaha this weekend for their final regular season home match. They've already brought home the regular season title with a win over the weekend. Make sure you get out for Fan Appreciation Day on Saturday and get your tickets at unionomaha.com. Wanted to get into, actually, let's get to TK first. I don't want to forget about our guy TK. Let's get to TK first here on the Herd Out Hotline. TK, what's going on, bud? Good morning, fellas. How are you doing? What's up, bud? So I want to, first off, uh, today's the explosive day. I have no clue what I'm supposed to end with from a workout. So y'all let you guys choose. Arms. It's always arms. What should I do for my last, my last exercise? Always arms. Well, it's explosives, Robbie. So do arms explosively, TK. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to, you know, make Damon happy and have an and, an and sentence. Dylan Riola needs to play with more confidence and the and, and the office entirely but the offensive coordinator doesn't seem to have confidence in his own play calls i i i, I could i could vibe with that i could vibe because with that. like 
think about it. Like this is this isn't just from Indiana because that game's a whole S show. And but like think about all the times that we got in two back run two back run games, and they get good yards with it. It they both they only pull it out in very certain situations. Mm. And maybe it's maybe that's why they get good good good, uh, good yards with it. But also you have some somebody like Barrett Liebentritt. And, like, you can see the offensive line wants to block that play. And other guys on that field want to do that. And it builds their confidence. But it it doesn't seem like Satterfield goes back to plays that, you know, might not have popped like they, he wanted to originally, but are going to pop. Mm. And I see that the same with Dylan when he refuses to run when there's 15 yards of green grass in front of him. Yeah. Yeah, I uh, appreciate the call, TK. I think our, if you're going to, again, if you're going to get into, I'm going to stop saying this, but if you're going to get in one back mm-hmm. and not run the ball with your quarterback but want to use R- RPO, you either have to use another back as a run option. Mm-hmm. I've, talk, I've, I've said this for years because Nebraska will sometimes fall into this trap. Um, you, you have to be, you have the basic premise of RPO. Mm-hmm is you want a vertical threat, you want an inside run threat, and you want an outside run threat. Mm-hmm. Don't think of it as running back, quarterback, receiver. You want an inside, yeah, it's what an does the outside, defense have to cover? An inside, outside, vertical. Mm-hmm. You want to put your adjusters in conflict. So you can you can get to RPO a lot of different ways without without QB run game. without QB run game. You just have to be willing to do that. So I will say, I, I think the if I had a criticism of the offense, and we sort of touched on this with Sam a little bit, is I don't feel good about what their identity is or what they think their identity yeah, is. Yeah, and my dumb butt. Like, I actually thought because Indiana was so uh, – what's the word I'm looking for? There just wasn't a lot of – oh, it's more. It was more like, oh, this is what they do. Mm-hmm. This is what they do. It wasn't a lot of wrinkles. It wasn't a lot of yeah. So what they proved is, mm-hmm. if mastering a few things is much greater than being average or less than average at a lot of things. Mm. Because I thought going in, I'm like, well, fudge. Maybe Nebraska's lack of an offensive identity may come as more of a surprise to Indiana because they won't know what to game plan for. Mm-hmm. But what happened was Indiana played a certain way versus run all the time. Mm-hmm. They played away versus they played two different ways versus pass between those two ways all the time. So there was a there's a run defense, and there was a pass, two pass defenses. They didn't vary from that. They just they made Nebraska earn it and Nebraska didn't mm-hmm. because Nebraska didn't have anything to fall back on. So if the the criticisms are you're not you're not good enough to not be consistent at something. Mm. That that's that's like the at the at the end of the day, you're not you're not good enough to not be consistent in something. So you have to be consistent in a couple of different things. I just don't know what that is yet. Yeah, and I think that's what I mean when I say identity, right? What are the things that I feel like, okay, whether it's third and four or like if you know Dylan can't run the ball, mm-hmm. you have to have some versatility in in your in your RPO game for a vertical threat, an outside run mm-hmm. threat, and an inside run threat. And I think that's where a lot of the you know I'm trying to give people the benefit of the doubt here and sift through emotions. I think that's where a lot of the frustration with Satterfield comes yeah, from. It's fair. It's fair. It's fair though because when you get a lot of the kind of varied looks and stuff, and I think that's when people. I don't know if they were articulating it well because I was getting frustrated with them. Uh, but I think when they get get upset with the gimmicky stuff or whatever, it's not that they don't want uh, Ja'Cory Barney to get the ball or Janarin Bonner to get the ball. It's that they feel like there's nothing behind it, right? Yeah. There's nothing to fall back yeah, you know, on. You know why Indiana could fit in the sweep game on Barney? You don't have a vertical look behind it. They don't have a vertical it. threat to worry about. Yeah, so safety just gets to come smoking down into mm-hmm. the box. Right, like you, you can fix that. But see, what people are misconstruing is, with, with the whole 
I think it was Justin or somebody said, "Oh, I know you like Satterfield. Stop with that." Mm-hmm. Like I'm very, I'm very, 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 very clear mm-hmm. about my affinity for Sat. Okay, it's it's the resolve that he had to have and the conviction with piecemealing that offense together last mm-hmm. year and why I liked his personality. I haven't said anything other than that. Mm-hmm. And I've also said, I don't know if this is going to work with Sat, but I do admire his resolve. Yeah. Like I've said, so we get like, first of all, let's stop with that. Now his next, his, the next thing that he has to be able to do mm-hmm. resolve and all is figure out, okay, we're struggling here. We're good at this. We're okay at this. You have to, you have to scrap it mm-hmm. because you played a team that showed you, and they hadn't done that to anybody else, Mm-mm. really. I mean, not start to finish like that. Yeah, no. If I'm good at, at four or five different things or three or four different things or two or three different things, if I could get to them multiple ways and we were very efficient, that's enough. Mm-hmm. It, it's enough because look around college football. I wasn't being – um condescending when I said, hey, I'm not as worried because I don't even know what Nebraska is supposed to look like yet on offense. Yeah. So I can't be like, oh, fudge. I'm in full-fledged panic. No, mode. but that could be frustrating, right? Oh, it's it's 100% but frustrating. doesn't mean you're ready to panic. No. Like if you knew but, what that's they, what, but that's what people want me to. I'm just not going to. Like if you knew what they were going to look like and you're like, ah, they can't get there, be- because, that's maybe where you panic. Because the real challenge is, and I, and I don't – I don't even know if I could do it if I did make enough money, but I I don't, I'm not, that's not my decision. Mm -hmm. I don't know when you bail on the process versus the outcome. Mm -hmm. I do know that you're still five and two. Yeah. And you have some goals that are achievable, but but you do have to make some tough decisions on, okay, the timeline is sped up on when I need to see an outcome in blank because we're trending in the wrong direction Mm -hmm. right whether it's special teams whether it's sequential play calling what whether it's defense whatever it is Mm -hmm. like you reach a point where okay the process isn't working versus uh, i'm not gonna panic yeah because any whether it's sometimes in a relationship like you, you, you think you're making progress mm-hmm. in some, you know, resurrection, and a couple setbacks will happen. You decide, okay, yeah, they're showing me their old traits again, or they're mm-hmm. this. I'm out versus, uh, we can work through that. Stay with the process. Yeah, businesses happen. It happens all the time, mm-hmm. all the time in businesses. Is this is this quarter? Is this? Are we trending? Yeah. Do we get away from what it is that we do well? Or do we need to address it? People have to make those decisions all the time. All the time. In every area of life. And and that's where Coach Rule is with this one. Yeah, and it's I I think there is the the important part of what you brought up there is there is a time where you have to pull the ripcord. Yeah. Right? Now determining that time is what is the difference between good decision makers and bad decision makers, right? And a lot of time it's the difference between being emotional versus rational. Because, or reactionary versus yeah knee jerk versus yeah. versus steadfast right because what I have seen a lot of whether it's in our YouTube comments whether it's on you know Twitter over the weekend whatever it is is well all of a sudden the the rule versus rank th- rank teams thing comes up and the whatever and my my simple question is okay if you're bringing that up or you're mad at rule you're mad at Satterfield whatever right just. Tell me what the next step is besides just being mad. Because I don't. So like if you like if like you if, if you don't like the OC, you don't like the wide receiver. That's what we hear, right? You yeah. Don't like the wide receiver. What's the next step? You're not going anywhere in the meantime. Right. Well, and and even let's let's say long term, right? Let's let's look big picture here. You're mad that Coach Rule is has a bad record against winning or against ranked teams, right? Through his his three college stops. Yeah. So what's the next step? Are you asking for a different head coach? Like, just tell me what you're asking for here, because I'm, I'm I really struggle with this because I look back and I go, OK, if they had won in overtime or if, if Dylan Riola makes a pass to Lindenmeyer, are we having this conversation about coach rules like we're talking about one play here, uh, an execution play, not a coaching play. Because what's next? Because are you 
Because I, I tell you what, if Nebraska had tried to hire Kurt Signetti from JMU, this place would have burned to the ground. Would have burned to the ground. <laughs> you know how I know that? Because there were coaches in a lot better spots than Kurt Signetti at JMU that Nebraska wasn't even hearing. Yeah. Chris Kleiman wasn't good enough for Nebraska during this coaching cycle. So what's the next step? If you're mad at rule and you're mad at the ranked record, what's the next step? Or are you just being mad to be mad? Kicking off hour number three here on Hernet Sports Radio, AM 590, ESPN, Omaha, ESPN, Tri-Cities, KFOR, and Lincoln. That's DB. I'm Ravi Lula here at Hernet Sports Bar and Grill. We've got Brandon Marcello joining us now. He's a national college football reporter for CBS Sports and 24-7 Sports. Brandon, how are you this morning? Doing very well. How are you? Good, good. Well, we're, we're a little shaken. Not quite stirred. <laughs> we're a little shaken uh, from coming back from Bloomington, taking that one. Uh, on the chin, but now that it's serious discussion, especially with their remaining schedule, uh, that Indiana could rapidly, or if not already, become the darlings of college football. Yeah, Indiana is legit, aren't they? Yeah. I mean, um, you know, I've been on their bandwagon the last four weeks. Correct. Don't worry about their quarterback, <laughs> uh, Curtis Rourke, who's just been phenomenal. Uh, legit, like, top ten team. I don't care what anybody else might say or whatever. Legit. And to take Nebraska, which is a very good football team this year, behind the woodshed and then some, uh, was damn impressive. Just clicking on all cylinders offensively, defensively. Um, incredible stuff by them. Uh, if I'm a Nebraska fan, I, I, I'm, you know, I'm upset, you know, but don't, don't let it get under your skin a little bit too much. That was like a perfect Saturday for Indiana. I mean, they, all the attention was on them finally. They're coming off a of bye week. And they just got hot and jumped all over you. Um, doesn't mean that Nebraska is suddenly not a bull team or suddenly someone that's not going to win another get big game or two. Be not to go all coach nerd on you or former player nerd on you, but the one one of the things I think that makes Indiana really really good is because of that RPO game and them mastering four or five things really well, they're capable of calling something at almost any time during the game. When you can run an offense like that, their expectancy numbers analytically are always going to be at a high level because there's flexibility within what they do because they so good at just a few things. They, they can run when they need to pass and they can pass when they need to run because they look so similar with what they do. Yep, and you know you're exactly right with that. But also, like they they run it so well, and they're perfect and just like not necessarily disguising things, but, but you don't know what to expect. Snap to snap, yep, uh, from them and what they're able to do. And Curtis is so freaking comfortable back there. I mean, even when there's some pressure in his face, he just has the time and the wherewithal and the patience to be able to deliver a good ball, no matter the situation. That's uh, so impressive. So that makes me wonder about now them having to start their backup. But even their backup was near perfect in a game that was starting to get out of hand at that point. But still, but the offense um, looked the same. It 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 right. It, looked, it didn't change anything. For nope. Them. Inside right. outside zone triple on the RPO one vertical threat. Like it was always the same. It just was somebody different doing it within that confine. And they've got receivers that are not necessarily all the same either. Everybody brings a little bit something different and. When you've got guys like that out there that are excelling at their one spot and their one job every single snap, um, it gives you so many options, so many opportunities. I mean, they're 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 going to win some more games here down the road, obviously. But I think people need to start taking them seriously when we talk about some of the some of the best, like maybe eight teams out there in the in the in college football. Brandon, as we're kind of having this conversation about Nebraska and Indiana, I, I kind of want to spin it into a lot of the things you see nationally, right? Because I think you look at Indiana's roster and you go, okay, there's some good players on there. Probably doesn't blow you away with talent, but we were like we were talking about with Rourke, his ability to be highly proficient at the things that he's asked to do is off the charts, right? So when you're watching these games nationally, how do you weigh teams that you see that are just hyper-efficient at maximizing and at at performing what they're asked to do at a high level versus some teams that are highly talented that maybe haven't figured that part out yet? Mm. That's a great question, and I've got two teams on top of my head right now when you talk about that, and we just saw them play against each other, Tennessee and Alabama. Yep. Mm. So much freaking yeah. talent, yep. 
so much freaking talent, and they can't freaking convert or be consistent <laughs> enough offensively. Um, quarterbacks, uber talented quarterback, five star guys, and Nico Iamaliava and Jalen Milrow missing wide open receivers down the field, not being able to connect with them. Yep. The running game getting stifled at times. Um, the scheme is there. The players just aren't quite connecting, and it's so frustrating for those fan bases, especially Alabama with two losses now. But even for Tennessee, they have not been able to score more than three touchdowns, really, in these last three or four games, and they finally get across that threshold against Alabama and win. But they were shut out in the first half for the third straight game mm. for an offense that was averaging nearly 70 points a game earlier in this season. They haven't scored a single point in the first half in the last three weeks for the first time since 1963. <laughs> How do you go from scoring nearly 70 points a game to not being able to do something you haven't done since 1963? It's frustrating. And meanwhile, you got Indiana out there just doing what they do every single week and executing all the finer points so well. I think if you want to look at a program that, quote-unquote, doesn't get a lot of respect, but they were just so consistent in their execution. When we talk about Indiana, look at Wake Forest like two, three, four years ago. Oh, yeah. Um, being able to always kind of challenge everybody. We're always in games, winning nine, ten games a year. That's a lot like what Indiana is. They just execute with really, really good players who are veterans at some very key spots and guys that have it to work their tail off throughout their careers. I mean, Elijah Sherratt, you guys saw a receiver. They call him the Waffle House because he's open on every play. <laughs> the guy started his career at St. Francis. Oh, yeah. He only well, had one offer from a Division II school. Then he goes to James Madison. Then he enters the transfer portal at James Madison. Doesn't really get any calls other than from smaller schools in the Power Five, um, and group of five, I should say. And then goes to Indiana, follows – Coach Sig there and uh, continues just to be the leader that he is. They, yeah. They've got, you know, Coach Sig does a great job, one, just in managing a group, but he finds these diamonds in the rough that he knows he can develop that know how to have that work ethic. And he's done that everywhere he's been. Um, he's just, I, could you imagine what Coach Sig could do with Alabama's roster? Yeah, or Tennessee's roster. Well, he'd, he'd be insane. He trimmed some of the attitude first because that <laughs> seems to be his greatest strength is getting guys to listen to what he says all day, every day, which is an underappreciated skill. Let me ask you something, B, about the knowns and unknowns and, and variances within teams. Both teams, I think, have a different kind of concern. I'll start with Iowa and compare them to USC. Iowa, tremendous identity. They are what they are. They're continuing along this this stretch of the good defense, the good special teams, and, and, and the shaky offense. And you pit that against USC, who is very inconsistent, maybe a little higher ceiling, but a significantly lower floor. In this day and age in college football, would you rather roll the dice on upside or have the consistency, even though it may not get you over the hump? Well, contextually, it depends on the fan base, so I, of course. But I would go with identity. <laughs> you know, I would go with identity. Yeah, because I, I was like, that. I would like to win as many games as they do, but their fan base has got to be pretty upset. So yeah, I, I sure. get it. Absolutely. And same with USC. I mean, they they love the flash and the glam and, you know, we're a team that likes to throw the ball around, maybe score 30, 40 points here and there. We got superstars. But they ain't winning, man. Um, and Lincoln Riley, I think he's like 5-9 and nine his last 14 games and um, just a terrible record right now. Yeah. Um, can't but finish. But the thing is, it's like – and they can't finish game. I mean, four-quarter losses here are the most I – mean, I can't remember what the stat was. But, um, you know, what's what's – not weird, but, you know, I was talking to Lincoln Riley back in um, July, and he was telling me, he goes, he goes, nationally, he goes, I don't think you guys understand that we're in a rebuild year at USC. No one wants to hear that, but we're in a rebuild year. We, we're, we're still trying to figure some things out. We're having to change quarterbacks, obviously, after Caleb Williams, but we're trying to reshape the defense after what it's been. We're trying to change their bodies. We're trying to change the scheme in addition to that. Um this is a team very much in rebuild mode this year. And what makes it so much more frustrating is that they've been in every game practically, well, they have been in every game, and they're losing them in the fourth quarter. It's almost like they're doing what Nebraska has been doing um, over the last several years in these late game situations. And it's, 
it's frustrating, very frustrating. But um, in this day and age, because of NIL, the coaches are going to have the year-to-year success are going to be the ones like a Kirk Ferentz or a Kurt Signetti where you can grab the attention of the players and you get them to buy into your system and the, your culture and the way you do things. Because I think we're seeing it now at USC, at Alabama, at Tennessee, even at Georgia to a certain extent. I think every program, you don't quite know what to expect week to week. I mean, Georgia came out flat at Alabama and was getting drilled. Mm. If, I mean, I think we all forget about that after the way they played at Texas. And then, and then at Texas, a few weeks later, they look like, they look like world beaters. Um, it's the personalities on that team. Um, also, not to get too long-winded here, but I've been saying this all year. Well, the last two years, it's been creeping up on us. But um, there's more talent than ever in the power conferences, right? Um, but that talent has never been more spread out in the power conferences. Mm. And that has equaled the playing field quite as just as much as everything I mentioned earlier as anything else. More level of concern in in Norman or in Tallahassee going forward? Uh, Norman, um, because at least Mike Norvell was building something there with high school recruiting and complementing that with transfer portal to where he got, he got them year over year some improvement and then got to an undefeated regular season last year. They lost a lot of talent, and I think they panicked and overloaded in the portal from the standpoint of let's lean on like five, six, seven, eight guys in the portal to be starters this year, and that blew up in their face. And they also put all their chips in the middle of the table for DJ Uyongale, who's never been it, right, at quarterback. So I got more confidence in Mike Norvell than I do in Brent Venables because Brent Venables hasn't really proven anything at OU. In fact, I questioned their administration's decision last June or July to just suddenly give Brent Venables a contract extension and raise – when no one was going after him for a job. Um, and now they're in this, this situation where he's got like a $45 million buyout. And a lot of fans there want him out. They don't think he's it at all. Um, you can change the offensive coordinator there all you want, but they don't quite have the guys. They don't have the horses to compete in the SEC, let alone the scheme or maybe the head coach to get it all together. Just nothing's clicking there. We're talking with Brandon Marcello of CBS Sports. Brandon, where do you draw the line with the kind of the top teams in terms of where there starts to be a fall off? Because I'm looking at Oregon and Georgia and Penn State and Ohio State and Texas. Then I'm also looking at Is Miami. Penn State in there? I mean, I'm just going by rankings. Gotcha. And then you've got Miami, Tennessee, LSU, Clemson. Like I could get to nine, I think, before I want to draw a line in terms of a clear – like, where do you draw that line in terms of tier one, tier two? I got it at six teams. Um, and, and these are my top six right now. Okay. And I think there's a big drop off. Mm. All right. It's Oregon, Georgia, Ohio State, Miami, Penn State, and Texas. After mm. that, I think there's a drop off. Um, I've got Indiana at seven right now, Clemson eight. Um, I think that that's kind of the line of demarcation at this point in college football. I think Texas could very well beat a Georgia team on a neutral site potentially if they were to rematch after they figure out everything. I mean, Georgia was bringing some things at them, some pressures they hadn't seen all season in Texas. And I think Georgia probably wins that game two times out of three, but you put it on a neutral site once again or something like that, maybe that one time out of three is that game for Texas. So I think Texas is still very much in that top tier of teams. And Penn State's got a sneaky, sneaky matchup this week going to Camp Randall at Wisconsin. Wisconsin playing so much better this week. Penn State can easily fall out of this top six tier, but if they win this week, I think they solidify themselves in that. But I think after six, it, it, I think not to say there's a big drop-off, but I think there's a very clear clear line separating everybody else. It's interesting when I listen to those six is I immediately think quarterbacks, and I'm trying to get my mind around the difference of, of in my confidence level, let's say against light competition of like a Drew Aller and an Arch and Manning and Quinn Ewers versus, I don't know, let's... A Dylan Gabriel and a Carson Beck? No, I want to go to Ohio oh, State. sure, yeah. And, and like needing to get over the hump offensively. How much of this is about quarterback play for you, Brandon? A lot of it is. It certainly is. Um, I still have a lot of confidence in Will Howard at quarterback. 
uh, despite his decision making late in that that Oregon game. I, I was there for that. I thought he performed well enough to obviously win that game. I thought he was pretty great, to be quite honest, on the road. That environment at Austin Stadium was electric, one of the best environments I've ever been in, including you know, 100,000-seat stadiums. It was incredible, and uh, I thought he did a very good job in that situation. Just wasn't aware of the time when he slid on the on the ground there, thinking he could set up a field goal try for the for the win. Um, but man, you know, the best quarterback out of all this bunch is uh, is honestly Cam Ward. Mm, yeah. I mean, I mean, listen, they Miami gives up 45 points on the road and wins. They haven't <laughs> given up 45 po- points on the road since 2022, and obviously two three years ago. Miami was losing a lot of games that were in the 20s, let alone the 40s, and yet they're winning those types of games now on the road. Uh, that just tells you how special Cam Ward is. So is that the great equalizer to, to Cristobal? Because for the last couple of years, it was, yeah, I like this, but, oh, I like Miami, but. It, apparently good quarterback plays. Very much so. Okay, okay. Very much so. It's, it's quarterback for him. I, I would say their defense has probably gotten worse from last year. Um, <laughs> and that's saying something, and, and I think that <laughs> – you know, without Cam Ward there, oh goodness, they probably got what three losses right now, and yet they're undefeated. Um, you know, just past the halfway point in the season, they, the, the kid's special. I mean, I, I think obviously we've seen in Miami now, but if you guys watch him at Washington State, he mm-hmm. he not only had to carry that team like he had to do here at Miami at times, but he had to carry the team and and the coaches and everybody, and it was forcing him into some mistakes um, that he isn't making today at Miami. Yeah, I mean, you flip Cam Ward and DJU, and I think we're having very different discussions about each of those seasons. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, but, Brandon, at, if we're talking about quarterback play and we're talking about where these teams fall in tiers, what do you do with a Notre Dame team where Riley Leonard all of a sudden is playing much more like I think we thought he might be able to? Yeah, sure. Uh, I want to see him against a above average defense uh, again um how does he perform there i will say that there is something to be said about being able to perform the way he has the last four weeks really and that building confidence and also allowing the coaches to do a little bit more offensively so not to say that these were exhibitions they certainly weren't but it gives them an opportunity to build off of that going into these bigger matchups including this week against navy a very very good navy team in New Jersey this week, that could be a dangerous spot for Notre Dame. But Riley Leonard now all of a sudden has more kind of some some more in the in the tank than what he had previously and the confidence in running that system and being able to throw the ball um, that he didn't earlier in the year win some big games, especially even in that win against Texas A&M. I, 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 you know, he wasn't great in that game throwing the ball, obviously. Um, but if they were to play that game once again, maybe Notre Dame wins it. But again, but does so in a more impressive fashion where we're looking at a Notre Dame today and going, you know, yeah, they lost Northern Illinois, but that was a hiccup, and maybe they are a legit, like, top eight team. So they both have a – is what I would call favorable, although apparently in this day and age in college football they're all tough <laughs> uh, from a schedule standpoint. But who gets less of the, yeah, but they have an easier schedule down the stretch talk? Is it Texas A&M or Clemson? Because both have favorable schedules. Uh, Texas A&M less, just because they have Texas left on the schedule. Um, they play LSU this week, where that's a battle of two, the last two undefeated teams in the SEC as far as conference record. So A&M still has to play two of the top ten, two two of the top three or four teams in the SEC being the, maybe the second strongest conference in the country, if not the strongest. Um, you know, whereas with Clemson, their toughest game remaining is at Pitt, right? And Pitt is borderline top 15 team right now, the way they're playing. Their offense is night and day what it was last year schematically. They're able to throw the ball around the yard and score points in bunches. Yeah. Uh, very dangerous game for Clemson coming up on the road there. But I, A&M's got the tougher schedule. Mm. So if you're looking at the Big 12, because I've I've got I've got some little pet peeve favorites, not pet peeves. <laughs> I've got some little pets, teachers pets, in the Big 12 in BYU and uh, Iowa State. A couple of coaches I really like. Is it fair to say the Big 12 runs through either Provo or Ames? Or are you still liking 
maybe the Wildcats down there in Kansas State a little bit? Runs through Kansas State and Iowa State. Um, BYU is going to trip up here at some point. Could be this week at UCF, and it sounds weird. To I don't say. even know who UCF you know? is. One, one, <laughs> you know, it's like I want to think they're good, but then I look at their inability to finish in clo- like that's a weird outfit at, at Central Florida. That the quarterback issues have been big for them. They had to bench KJ Jefferson, the transfer from Arkansas. Yep. They got a quarterback in there now that can't throw the ball, but he can damn sure run it. And the reason why I say it's a dangerous game for BYU is because Oklahoma State brought in their backup quarterback to start that game, and, he, and they changed everything schematically around him, and they're running the ball effectively because the run the quarterback was a runner. And all of a sudden, Ollie Gordon had a po- pulse, didn't he? <laughs> right they were able to take some pressure off Ollie Gordon through the quarterback being able to run the ball, and so he was able to run the ball more effectively. Then when that quarterback got hurt and they brought Alan Bowman in, who can't run the ball worth a damn, they still schematically ran the ball and continued to do their game plan, and Alan Bowman was able to break some runs off himself (laughs) because of the scheme against BYU. UCF, that's what they do very well. They run the ball, no matter the player. I mean, they had two two players go for over 150 yards rushing, I think, this past week. Hmm. Um, that is a very dangerous spot for BYU having to go to Orlando this week. All right, Brandon, if you're looking at a team that's in position for a playoff spot right now, who do you have the most concerns about? Good question. Let me look through my list here. Um, got to be LSU, right? That's. I mean, I didn't want to. I didn't want to taint the answer, but maybe LSU. Um, yeah, I yeah, it's LSU at this point, but they seem to be finding their identity a little bit. I actually watched them in person this week uh, in Fayetteville, Arkansas. They dominated Arkansas in the trenches. Um, it's interesting to see the them weapons. get stops now, too, a little bit. Yeah, they're getting the stops. They've got the weapons to be very good. Garrett Nussmeyer didn't even have to throw a single touchdown pass to blow out Arkansas this past week because K. Durham, their young running back, uh, he's running for 100-plus yards in every game now. He scored, uh, I think, eight touchdowns in the last five games. He had three touchdowns against the Hogs this week. Um, you know, big game for them this week at Texas A&M, biggest game of the year for them right as of right now. If they win that game, sets up a monster matchup against Alabama that can end up being an elimination game for the playoff spot, even with LSU still undefeated in some instances there. Um, but, um, yeah, LSU out of that top 12 that I have right now, has the most questions, even more so than the Notre Dame. Let me do, let me get you out of here on this real quick rapid fire. Of the oranges, the burnt, the cream sickle, and base, who do you like out of Clemson, Texas, and and Tennessee? Uh, Texas. Okay. Uh, deeper across all all fronts, um, and they've got two really great quarterbacks. No matter who they end up deciding to, to start week to week at this point, even though it looks like it'll be Quinn Ewers got a lot more confidence in the long ones. Mm, that's Brandon Marcello joining us from CBS Sports. Brandon, great stuff. We appreciate it, and hopefully we'll catch up again soon. Yeah, no problem. See you guys. That's DBM. Ravi Lula. We'll be back. More Herd Sports Radio coming up next. Welcome back to Herd Sports Radio AM 590 ESPN Omaha, ESPN Tri-Cities, KFOR and Lincoln. That's DB. I'm Ravi Lula. It's time for Bet On It, brought to you by War Horse Sportsbook. The best place in Nebraska to place your sports bets. Get to warhorsecasino.com to check out all their events and promotions they've got coming up. Got one more week in their $10,000 giveaway this Saturday coming up. Make sure you check out warhorsecasino.com for all the details. DB? I was a little surprised at Brandon's affinity for Texas. Yeah. How'd you know I was going to say Texas? Well, because that was the last question he asked about. And he's seen any... I'd mentioned Texas earlier about winning on a Club neutral Club is field. playing better than both yours and Manny. Correct. I have a hard time with Clemson because I dislike Dabo so much and because of what we had seen. I think I think a lot of what our issues with Club is what we had seen last year where we're like, oh, we don't think he's very good. And his propensity to give it to the other team. So, so I think we have a hard time unseeing certain things with Club Nick. But I don't, I don't disagree. I think Club Nick's playing better. I think Texas – has more talent than Clemson does, but I think Klubnik is playing better than yours or Manning right now. I agree with that. Would you rather be Sharon Moore or Kalen DeBoer? Uh, Sharon Moore. Do tell. I think that 
Alabama job was one of the worst jobs you could take in the country last year. Something is like something's wrong there. Just in yeah, something's wrong there. For a guy, for a coach that doesn't appear to be that emotional, mm-hmm. his team is very emotional, and he's been way more emotional this year on the sidelines. If you've watched him, I watched a lot of Kalen DeBoer, oh, yeah, even when he was at Fresno State. Like that's my guy. And he's been way more emotionally volatile on the sidelines this year than he has been in years past. And that's not to say that he was, you know, Osborne over there before, but he's re- he gets he's been really tuned up sometimes this year. But that was, I mean, this this was my fear. I talked about this last year. This was my fear about him taking the job. Was whoever took that job was going to get fired, no matter what happened. At some point, the guy that replaced Saban was getting fired, or is getting fired. That's a I fully believe that's, that's that. Pre- that's pretty strong. That's the thing I will bet on. Like, it's, it's bet on it. I will bet on, at some point, Kalen DeBoer will be fired from Alabama because of the situation he inherited, because of the guy he followed. Mm. Whereas, like, yes, Harbaugh got them the national title. He got them the three playoff appearances, right? But it wasn't the best run we'd ever seen in college football history. This was a guy from his staff that was seen as the natural successor. And I think everybody understood at Michigan that this was going to be a pretty hard reset based on who they lost, both on the coaching staff and on the roster. I would rather right now be Sharon Moore because I think Michigan is a more reasonable place to be the head coach right now than Alabama is. Uh, and they're strangely connected. Um, would you rather be Brett Venables or Lincoln Riley? Whew. Pass. No. Um, <laughs> how about the ma- How about Joel? Like three weeks ago, about USC, questioning whether they would get to a bowl game. That's. I mean, it's a it's a fair call out because it gets dicey here. Okay, who would you rather be? Because hold that thought for a second. Okay. Okay, who would you rather be, Venables or Riley? I'm gonna say Riley. Okay. So, but not. I mean, I don't feel great about it. Obviously. So I asked. I asked um, a couple of our buddies because mm-hmm. you and I were talking off air. Nebraska's in a precarious spot. Five and two, Ohio State, quote unquote, looming. Mm-hmm. And if eight was the number. Mm. And I said to you, which likely three would it be? Yeah. From, a, from a matchup standpoint. I think. So, so I asked a couple of our peers mm-hmm. in the media. And they, I'm so you know I'm on this page. Mm-hmm. They say UCLA, Wisconsin, and Iowa. From a, I get right. Nobody's like saying they'll win. But like if you just had to, if you're like, hey, they're ma- gonna win three if, more. If they're if you're looking at matchups, mm-hmm. you threw one in there that I think is interesting on the heels of this conversation because you say you don't think they're very good. Yeah. If you put, go ahead. That would be USC. Who would you take out? Wisconsin. So you think Iowa or Wisconsin at home is more formidable than Iowa there on Black Friday at whatever time that kick? Wisconsin's, be. I think they've turned a corner in the last few weeks and they're playing a lot better. And that's a team that I didn't think would get to this point this season. And Iowa's worse than I thought they were. Obviously, I thought this was a ten-win no-brain team, no-brainer team. Their defenses regressed a lot more than I thought they were. They took the steps forward on offense that I thought they would. I didn't anticipate their defense struggling the way they have. And I think Iowa is right now a better matchup for Nebraska, even on the road, than Wisconsin is at home. Oh. I think they sweep the UC. I, either way, I feel less confident about that than I do that they're going to sweep the California. Teams. What you, so you, just the health at, at Piscataway is caught up with Rutgers. I think now, so. Now they've got to travel to Southern Cal. Yeah. I, I also think like we talked about this when Nebraska played them. Rutgers' margin of error is razor thin. The way they play, yeah. right, and with kind of where their roster's at right now. The way they play, they're going to have a razor-thin margin of error. So if any of that goes away, you're in trouble. Now, I'm not – I wasn't – it's not egregious, but I, I, my bad. Mm-hmm. I said at this particular time, it, it looks like on watching mm-hmm. that Illinois is better than Indiana. I'm not sure that's the case. But Illinois is pretty good. I still might ride with that. Yeah, I don't know. It's closer that. than I thought it was for sure. I don't know about that. Um, Indiana's, I knew Indiana was better and pretty good. They're better than I thought they were. So that's a, I'm fully admitting that. 
Illinois won min- with min- – they went minus three in turnovers. Yeah. They had 80 yards passing. They kind of – They had 266 total yards. Yeah. And, and the game and, was never like – And they sort of beat Michigan's head in. It was crazy yeah. to watch. Yeah, it really was. And so I I don't know. I, I think Illinois can – I think Illinois can make things really difficult for just about everybody. And if – and I don't know how good Penn State is, right? Yeah, but, I was surprised you quickly threw them in there, but you're. you're going I was just by going rankings. straight off the rankings, right? So, and I because I, I didn't want to bias I, the question. Their, their offense is. I don't. I just don't know. I, I don't, don't know. totally trust it, but I feel. I think this year more than any other year, at least in recent history, I don't see a ton of separation in those top five or six teams, whether you want to include Penn State or not. Everybody gets the yeah, but question. One hundred percent, right? right? Yeah. yeah, there's a yeah, but for every single team in that group. And so I don't know why I would exclude Penn State's yeah, but, but I don't exclude Texas's yeah, but, right? Yeah, I don't yeah. exclude somebody else's yeah, but, right? I still, I mean, I'm still not enamored with the way Dylan Gabriel plays all the time, right? Mm. I'm still not enamored with everything. Like Oregon is probably, des- I mean, they're deservedly number one right now. But if Will Howard has better situational awareness, are we having this conversation about Oregon? You know, so we, we get. I don't know. We're assuming that they make that field goal. I don't sure. know. Sure. But, like, it very easily could be those roles are reversed. Yeah. With Will Howard and Dylan Gabriel at their respective schools, right? So I think that's a – that's when I when I say that I don't think there's hardly any difference in those top six teams. That's what I mean. I, I don't look at any of those teams as significantly better than anyone else. Yeah. I don't know. I, I just think – I have more confidence – and and I go back to the second half in the playoffs where Ewers actually did play a lot better mm-hmm. in the playoff. But I just look at for as iffy as I am on Beck sometimes. Yeah. I think he'll make a play before any of the questionable quarterbacks so this of what, those elite teams. This is what I like about Beck, right? Is he can play really, really bad. And it doesn't deter my confidence that he can still go make a play. There's some guys that if it goes bad, I'm like, oh, this is never getting back on the tracks, at least not today, right? Carson Beck, what did he throw, three picks on Saturday? Yeah. Carson Beck, he, he played bad in the first half against yeah. Alabama, Yeah. right? That's a dude that, uh, and I'm not saying I love the mistakes, but I don't, everything doesn't have to go perfect for me to think he can make a play down the stretch. Mm. And I really appreciate that about Carson Beck. I got Joel's bet on it. What's that? He said Illinois is better than Indiana. In fact, now this is crazy. Mm. Illinois is better than Indiana. In fact, I'm pretty confident Indiana will lose to Washington. Ooh, I don't know. Really? I don't know. Their schedule the rest of the way out is pretty favorable. Is is he being serious? That's going out there. I you could, I would still make an argument that. Illinois, that you can make an argument that Illinois is better than Indiana. I think it's probably pretty close. I think those are very similar teams in terms of quality, even if stylistically they're not. But I, I don't know, losing to Washington, I don't know. Washington isn't playing like they were a few weeks ago. <laughs> that's, that's, that's that's getting out there. I think both are kind of bold. I'm not. You know what else I'm betting on still? What? Nebraska and eight wins. Wouldn't that be something with all the all the hand ringing, all the pearl clutching, as, as all my, the consternation. As my offensive line coach would say, I don't even know if this is where he says, pestivity. <laughs> pestivity. <laughs> Everybody being upset. Oh, well, yeah, he's he's 100. He's, he's serious. I, I would say I don't think Joel messes around a lot. Uh, that's CBM. Rob Lula will wrap up the show. That's Bet On It brought to you by War Horse Sportsbook. More Herd at Sports Radio coming up next. Wrapping up the show here on Herd at Sports Radio, AM 590, ESPN Omaha, ESPN Tri-Cities, KFOR, and Lincoln. And we're brought to you by our friends over at MH Hospitality. The holiday season's coming up. You've got some friends, family, whoever coming in town. Get over to mhhospitality.net to check out their portfolio. they got four hotels in Omaha currently. They've got a couple more coming next year. But they've got you covered for friends and family coming in town. Stay once and carry memories forever. That's MH Hospitality. DB, I got asked a good question on the internet, which doesn't happen a lot. Uh-huh. <laughs> I get a lot of, asked a lot of bad questions on the internet, but occasionally we get good ones. And I got a good one in my DMs uh, during that last segment. 
And I think it's a fair question too. It was, we talked about maybe simplify, simplifying and nailing things down to like some key concept and mastering those things, right? Indiana did a really good job at that. Maybe that's something Nebraska hasn't done a great job of. If Nebraska offensively were to nail things down to three or four key concepts, what would you like to see those be based on? Power, counter, and duo. Okay. And run action off of that. Power, counter, duo. Okay. Um, then you, that gives you your play action. You can still utilize quick game. But I think schematically, that's what I would do running the football. Uh, because I think this offense has to decide mm -hmm. how are you going to run the football? Not like throw my hands up, like how are we going to, like, no, li like literally the style. Yeah. You're going to insert with H backs, you're going to lead. Um, because I do think there's something to that because I think the backs have to see it enough mm -hmm. where they can start to get better feels for it. Sure. And sometimes, listen, you can't, you can't just, you can't just get in the gun out of one back and say, "Hey, here's zone." Yeah. Especially without a QB run threat, right? Yeah. You just because then you run into the numbers problem we talked about earlier. Yeah, it's it's just like it's not. I've said this for years, mm -hmm. and I'm not, and I'm a like a ding dong. <laughs> we can stop zone without quarterback run game in our sleep. Mm -hmm. Now you you add the quarterback run game, okay? Then you got to scheme a little bit. Yeah. Right. Right now we got to decide. You know we're playing Papio. Right? Listen, good RPO team. Want to play the? You want to change our fun? Play this guy in a six, mm -hmm. so we can free up my outside linebacker. Or do we? So we. You, but then we. So then we go back and we say, okay, how many QB? How many design QB runs? Are they really reading the RPO? Mm -hmm. They're good at it. But so there's that guessing game. So if if I'm Nebraska and they do it without Liggins having to like, he's a good athlete, but like utilizing QB run game. So if if I'm Nebraska, I look at that and I say, all right. How do we get to the perimeter mm. with our run game if it isn't our quarterback? Because in true triple, again, you want an inside threat, you mm -hmm. want an outside threat, you want a vertical threat. And you'd like to act, ideally put your number two defend or one of your safeties in conflict, mm -hmm. right? One of your adjusters in conflict. So how how does how does power counter do? Because you can do power out of two back, you mm -hmm. can run counter out of two back. Even you ready for this? Mm -hmm. You could put two real running backs whoa next to the quarterback in gun and have that second running back be your outside run threat mm, rather than the quarterback. Right. And still use your RPO concept to two receiver side and have conflict. Mm. Right? Prep did it to Prep they actually have a nice, they have a pretty slick little scheme that they did where you know, they'd fake inside zone to your back. They'd bring two around as the pitch back, and they would run an RPO scheme on the perimeter. Mm -hmm. So our safety has to decide, okay, if he's coming down into the box, is he coming as a run fitter or is he coming to stop this RPO? Yeah. Right? So, like, you can – there's multiple ways to get to it. Nebraska just has to kind of settle it. You can't sprinkle it in. It has to be – A staple. What you do. Yeah. Because it, it takes some reading and timing. Mm. So, so there's there's things that they can do, but those are the concepts that I would do because you give me the versatility to use a fullback or an H back, mm. and I always want a two back concept if my quarterback isn't a viable running threat. Even if it's not a traditional fullback, right? Yeah, he doesn't, doesn't have to be those H backs. We've seen, we've seen just Bonner. give me a second running threat. Yeah, in the backfield with the quarterback. So we've seen like Bonner run up uh, or line up in that spot. We've seen Barney line up in that spot. We've seen Fedoni kind of come across as a as a second back if you will, although I don't think a ton of people are afraid Fedoni was going to run the ball there. Um, so if you're doing those three things, you're running power, you're running a duo, you're running counter, and you're trying to get to the perimeter still, mm. at what point is it just a matter of execution of, hey, these are the things we do. I still need somebody to block on the outside. Mm, yeah. Like I still need somebody yeah. to win on a perimeter blocking battle because yeah. that's the thing we haven't seen happen either yeah. very often or consistently. Yeah, uh, game dog says, and I, I don't, I don't agree necessarily because it's, it's more concept. Like you have to honor it. 
Mm-hmm. Right? Not everything's going to be a big play, but I, I kind of get what he's, or I'm assuming him, but uh, it says ne- Nebraska doesn't have the talent at running back and the limited talents that running backs we do have. Playing shotgun run game ain't going to cut it. Uh, with the number 15 needs to be under center and let the running backs come downhill. I could, I get it. And I'm not adverse to that idea, mm-hmm. right? He's talking about some sort of lead blocker, eye back. You can sch- schematically, you can still do that out of the gun mm-hmm. because what you have to remember, and it's, so why I'm listening is because he said the downhill part. Yeah. So. You can put him in pistol. You can put the running back behind the quarterback, still be in the gun. Sort of done a lot with pistol, low key. Pistol's hard. Yeah, pistol would drive man queen. It it's harder than offset, like sidecar, because you you give yourself a two way go. Mm -hmm. Um, unless you do front side handoffs. But what I do like that he says is the downhill thing because if you get in pistol. And it's downhill versus a lateral lead step like zone. Mm-hmm. You're still at the same depth from the running back spot. I'm still six yards deep. I'm still mm-hmm. seven yards deep behind the line of scrimmage. So it's not that the quarterback's underneath center. It's the path of the back right. and the run game. Right. So now I'm now I'm saying because it's not gun versus underneath no, center it's necessarily. About, it's about lateral first step versus downhill vertical first step. First step. Yeah. Right. Yeah, Which so I think makes a lot of sense. Yeah, but it's a distinction. He's the first. Like a lot of people don't make that distinction. Right. They they'll they'll lead, they'll lead you to believe. Well, you get underneath center. I'm like, well, the back is still seven yards deep. Do you mean you want him to get downhill first? Yes, that's what they mean. Okay. Generally, I don't I know. I I like the fact he actually said. I appreciate. I do too. I think in general, when I hear people say, "Why don't you get under center?" It's that they want guys to get downhill because what you lose in downhill run game, unless it's QB power out of the gun in their sidecar, is getting is direct flow yeah it's almost never direct flow Mm -hmm. that's why like when people get really mad about people line up in shotgun and third and short fourth and short or whatever the running back stays insane but that's a good distinction to make yeah i'm vibing with it that's a good distinction to make my question would be my man is putting downhill in caps he (laughs) he wants to smash them up hey i get it right that sounds like what's it sounds like what coach rule wants too yeah. So, do you hear conflict? I do. Okay. Well, I don't know if I hear conflict. I see versus hear conflict, right? Okay. What I hear because something will have to change quickly, right? It, yes. Because what you hear Coach Rule say yeah. is not what we see. Yes, that's yes, that's what I mean, right? What they tell me they want to be is not what I see them trying to be, mm. and it's not just an Indiana game, right? Like, yes, they have been better about it in in other games, but there is a disconnect, I think, between what Coach Rule thinks the identity of this team needs to be versus what we're actually seeing offensively. Mm. I think that's true. Yeah. What I don't know is if that is because of play calling. I don't know if that's because of schematics. I don't know if that's because of personnel. That's what I don't know. Here's what I do know, though, is if you're going to be critical of Satterfield, that's fine. But my question is, why does it stop at Satterfield? Like, if you're concerned about the offense, right? Like, Glenn Thomas is your co-offensive coordinator. Is he not involved in planning? Yeah. We give Glenn Thomas a pass? Yeah. No, like, I'm, if I'm we, with you. If we think Dylan Riola has regressed, Glenn Thomas is the quarterback's coach. Do we give Glenn Thomas a pass? Like, if we think, and I know people don't love Garrett McGuire because he's young and whatever, and but, like, if we think the, 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 run, the wide receivers haven't been as good as their talent shows... Like, should we not be also having questions about Garrett McGuire? If we think the running backs aren't as good as we think they need to be, should we not also be having questions about EJ Barthel? And I think a lot of those guys are good coaches, yeah. right? But my point is, why I don't understand why it gets hyper-focused on Satterfield. Is it just the play calling? If we Do we think that, hey, maybe Satterfield puts together a great scheme and a great game plan and, really, and draws up really good concepts, but I just want somebody else to call the plays? Because that's a distinction I'm willing to hear out. Yeah. Right. But I, I what I what I really struggle with is I need people again, take the next step. If we've got a complaint about somebody, take the next step. What is the complaint? Is it you think the concepts are bad or you don't like the play call? That's why you're vibing with Game Dog. I think Game Dog makes some good points sometimes. That's the first time. I don't I've I gotta pay my, my I've attention. seen him a little bit recently. Yeah. I, I haven't seen him long term, but he makes some good points. And 
And I'm willing to hear that, right? I'm willing to hear, like, hey, I actually think the scheme's okay. I need the play calling to be better. Or, I, hey, I think Satterfield needs to be better, and I think Glenn Thomas needs to be better. Well, how many snaps did Bonner get? Four. Oh, okay. Which I don't love. No, I. so clearly there, there's something there. I don't know what. Yeah, I'm just trying to figure out because your perimeter run game, your perimeter run blocking has to match your run game. Yeah. And, and like and clearly those two things aren't synced. So Bonner if, if I'm a little more off tackle, do I want better tight end run blocking or do I need better wide receiver sure. blocking? These are all the things that you have to think about schematically. Yeah. As an OC. If you're gonna go alley run game, you you better be good handling guys out on the perimeter, otherwise you can't do it. So that's my question is, like, listen, let's if we're going to be critical of Satterfield, let's be critical of Satterfield, but there's a lot of other pieces on that offensive coaching staff. If you've got questions about this thing across the board, that those questions need to be asked across the board. Yeah. That's DB. I'm Robbie Lula. We'll be back tomorrow with more for Sports Radio.